Hey, everybody, it is Nicholas Rogers with the All Are Welcome podcast. I'm also known as Big Timber. Today, I have one of my good friends, Randy from Randy Reviews It. He's also another gun tuber here on the YouTube channel <laughs> or the YouTube. And yeah. Um, yeah, Randy, I mean, let's let's just jump right into this, man. I think you and I are kind of the same in the mindset and we're both, uh, you know, we, we love the same things, I think, and we deal with the internet trolls the same way. So Randy, introduce us to yeah. yourself. So uh, I started a channel, Randy Reviews It, after I finally stopped playing World of Warcraft uh, because uh, basically I bought a gun that a bunch of gun influencers said was amazing, and it turned out not to be amazing. Mm. And I wanted to start a channel to give, like, regular people to maybe give them some, like, word of warning type videos on like, hey, maybe you shouldn't spend money on this kind of thing. Great for, you know, reaching out in the community and branching out because, uh, you know, if I make a career of telling everyone not to buy anything, who's going to want to actually send me anything as well? Right. So it's, far, it's been pretty good. Yeah. Do you, do you mind sharing then with us what the firearm was that everybody recommended? And then when you bought it, yeah. it was a POS? Uh, well, it's the Walder PPQ Classic. So oh, really? Everyone's, like, I'll give it, it's got a great trigger. But, like, I felt like the grip was a little bit too short for my hand. Like, it's just okay. a little too short. And then no one told you about the recoil impulse, which is awful. Like, just mm. like how you're seeing on the PDPs, and I've done a few videos on it, Walder cannot spring their pistols correctly from the factory, it seems like. Like, wow. everyone's like, switch to the 13-pound. It'll change your life. And it's like, okay, well, I wish I, you know, didn't have to do this, that they did it from the factory, mm. but yeah. Yeah. So I have, I have a Walther PPS. So okay. I have the old school, like single stack Walther PPS. And that was my motorcycle pistol for a long time because it's a very thin, I mean, it's like that yeah. thin of a profile. So it went really nice in my vest. It didn't print in my motorcycle vest. And it actually, with the plus two extender on there, so it was like eight rounds, which was not much, uh, it actually was really easy for me to reach in with my left hand and be able to pull it out of my vest pocket. Uh, and I actually had to do that once on the bike. I was driving south of Colorado Springs towards Canyon City, Colorado, and I was getting on a, an on-ramp to get onto Highway 50. And as I was getting on that on-ramp, all of a sudden, this truck full of teenagers came flying up on my tail side. And then they pulled around beside me and they were hanging out the window yelling at me and the driver started swerving into my <laughs> lane. So I said, all right, I'm going to just hit the brakes. And I hit the brakes and then they got in front of me and then like hit the brakes and, and tried to, you know, get me to run into the back of them. So then I tried to go around them and they got in front of me uh, in the in the left lane. So I got back in the right lane and they they slowed down and started yelling at me and the guy was coming into my lane. So I just reached in my, my vest pocket and I had you know, pulled it out. Once they saw that, they slammed on their brakes. And then I just, I, I took off as fast as I yeah. could to get away from them. So, I mean, I, I used to love that Walther PPS until I got a notice from Walther saying that, hey, this particular version of the PPS has a drop safety issue. And if Ooh. you were to drop this, there's a really good chance that it could accidentally go off, kind of like the older SIGs. What was it? Yeah. SIG P320? I yeah, think the, the 320. The 320. I don't know if it's an older issue yet. That's still kind of to be decided, <laughs> to be determined, uh, you know. But, yeah, the 320 had the, the the originals had a real drop issue, and now it's more of an out-of-battery thing, I think, that comes up every now and then. Right. But it, it's, it's still unsure that if it's internet lore or bad ammo or whatever it is. Yeah, but, man. I mean, I, I, for a while there, I thought a lot of that SIG P320 stuff was kind of like BS until I actually saw a video of a guy that had his pistol in his holster and it went off. Yeah. Um, I don't know if maybe the holster was improperly fit to the pistol and the trigger was somehow engaged and it, it allowed the pistol to go off. But that did kind of make me a little nervous when I saw that. But I don't own a 320. I only own... I. My wife owns a P365 XL Rose, and I have the P365X Macro Tac Ops, and we haven't had any issues with ours. Yeah, the 365, it seems like they've resolved it. I'm a big fan of, like, Ben Stoger. I don't know if you follow him at all, but he posts uh, 
he he had a pretty good like month where he was posting like another 320 at this range, another 320 at this range. Oh wow! And then there was a range out in California somewhere where they only allowed a 320 if it had a manual safety on it. Really? Yeah, like they wow. posted. It was like some competition. Just that range had like a a notice okay. that said if you're bringing a 320, it needs the side safety. No. You know, if it, if it's a known issue and you're operating a range, you want to keep it as safe as possible. Yeah. You know, I've seen in some like three gun and two gun videos where people are running with their pistol and they accidentally shoot themselves in the foot, you know. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's terrifying because I, I, yeah. I, I want to get into competition hopefully this year. Right. And uh, I mean, I'll try to be as safe as possible, but you never know. Like, yeah, their, their accidents happen. So. They do. I mean, they, they do, yeah. you know, uh, it's, it's just accidents do happen, but if we follow basic firearm safety yeah. as an individual, we can prevent as much human caused accidents as possible. You oh know? yeah. And that guy, if you watch the video that I'm talking about, he had his booger hook on the trigger. So, yeah. And he just kind of was running and shot himself in the foot. Now, let me ask you this, Randy, because you're kind of new to the YouTube or new to me. I've only seen you on here for probably about six months, maybe a little bit less. I don't know. How did you become so popular so fast? Because we talked about last year, you spent nearly, goodness gracious, what, like $20,000 in guns? Uh, 24000 uh on stuff. So, yeah, I spent 24000 on ammo, on stuff to review, on things like that. You know, I, I haven't had anything really given to me. Uh, okay. yet or anything like that but i think so what really took off with me was the ar tier list video that i did so i did an ar tier list back in i want to say october and that's like a 40 minute video that has like 125,000 views wow and so for me what i what i've noticed and i'm a big fan of like data like i went to school for psychology and was doing stuff like that with data. I work in software, um, that sort of thing. But uh, data is everything. And if you watch any like Grand Thumb or any of these videos, if you look at the comment, everyone's like, well, how does this compare to this? But there's not really videos comparing everything. So that's right. where I saw like video games where they were like, hey, comparing all the World of Warcraft expansions and all this stuff. So I was like, okay, what if I did that with AR-15s? Okay. Um, so that people are like, okay, you know, here's here's what I'm interested in. He, I want to know where it stacks up, what the downfalls of all that are compared to other AR-15s. I've been lucky enough to have, like, a lot of friends that have uh, different brands of AR-15. It's not like we're all just CMMG guys or anything like that. So I've had time behind a, a decent amount of these. Or I should say everything I reviewed, I've spent time behind. Okay. I left off a few on the list, and in the comments, everyone was like, where do you think this should fall? And it's like, look, I haven't spent time behind it. I'm not going to comment on it. But it's people want to know how it compares to other things. Like, how do you like the 365 versus the Hellcat Pro? People are always asking stuff like that. So I'm working on something on the back end. I can't talk too much about it yet. But the problem with YouTube and gun YouTubers in general or reviewers is everything's anecdotal. Yeah. So I could have a Walther and have a miserable experience with it, but everyone else could have a good experience. And here, sometimes the negative voices are the loudest, right. unfortunately. So, like, you might hear that, oh, this Walther sucks. So-and-so said it was awful mm -hmm. or something like that. And it's not necessarily true. So what I'm looking to do is combine data to give you an overall bird's eye view of what do they think something should be worth? What do they like? What do they dislike? That sort of thing. So I got a, I got some things laid out. I got to trademark some things so that it doesn't get taken or anything like that down the road. Okay. But uh, I've booked a website, and there's some things coming on that. Hopefully this year I can get that up and running. Okay. But uh, that's the one thing that I've noticed with the, the YouTube gun review community is it's so anecdotal. And I, I don't want – people to spend their money, their hard-earned money, on something that maybe I had a good experience on, and then they got the one that had bad QC. And they're just like, dude, you had me waste $800 on this yeah. because of your review. Like that, 
I would feel guilty for that. So what I try to do is just give my honest opinion on what I got. And right now I'm trying to figure out a way to how to gather everyone's kind of information with that. I, I think that that's an important thing about your channel. And it's one of the reasons why I like watching your reviews is because you're a no BS type of guy and you're, you're honest. You're not brutally honest, but you're honest, right? Uh, brutally honest doesn't get you monetized. <laughs> brutally honest doesn't get you yeah. monetized and it really will make it so that people don't want to work with you. And that's what people don't understand. Like that aren't content creators is when you start saying, Hey, I'm going to make YouTube videos, either a part-time or a full-time job. You're, you're doing this to make an income, whether it's not, it's through the advertisements with YouTube or it's to become sponsored with your channel through manufacturers. At the same time too, people want to see either, it seems like two things. They want confirmation that what product they purchased is good or two, yep. people love negative press. They want to see somebody rip apart a product that they don't necessarily care for just because that gives them confirmation that purchasing that or not purchasing that product was the right decision. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So it's kind of a fine line you have to dance and have you gotten to the point? So you're saying not, you haven't really started to receive stuff for free to review or have you? I haven't. Okay. So, uh, this year, I uh, actually, this week was the first time I'm booking something where I've gotten a discount on it. I still had to buy it with my own money, mm. but I received a discount on it and it's on the way. Also like, uh, so backstory with my channel, maybe partially why it grew is I've had, solid mentors and friends in the industry where so when i started my channel uh i was just in you know I, i've been doing it for like i think five months at the time and i was in a cigar lounge and they're like well what do you do i'm like oh i uh i work i'm a software consultant and then also i started a youtube channel after i quit playing video games they go we got a youtuber here have you ever heard of pew pew tactical and i was like no nah, i never heard of them really and and i i hadn't heard of them at the time and then Johnny B walked in and I was like, wait, that's the 180 second ideas guy. And mm -hmm. I was like, I know him. So I've been lucky enough where he's kind of said the same thing that you did. And, it, and he's also like, helped me like, okay, we both own a blackout defense gun, right? That's a very, very top tier gun that not a lot of people are going to be dropping that kind of cash on. So the amount of views or the amount of people searching for that is very low. Right. But if you if you did a video on, let's say, the new Glock 19, because there's so many people out there looking for it, you're going to get more views and your channel is going to grow. So part of it was, although I like the really high end stuff, that's not what most people are probably on YouTube looking for. So like good point. And then he brought up, you know, a lot of people are just there to buy like, hey, you I bought this. Is it good? That confirmation bias. And then if they're like me, before you buy something, you want to know, like, are there any pitfalls with this? Like, are there, mm. you know, like, there's a bunch of weapon lights. I don't know if you've been testing them, but trying to find a holster for some of these is like right. near impossible. It's like, okay, right. so you're selling me a weapon light that I can't get a holster for. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care how good the light is. If I can't put it in a holster, then it does me almost no value. Yeah. You know? That's a good point. That's a really good point. You brought up Blackout Defense, man. I... I that's one of my favorite companies out there because of the customer service is fantastic and their attention to detail is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I've actually been an affiliate with them now for over a year. Nice. But I became an affiliate after I purchased the gun myself at a hundred percent cost to me. Right. Yeah. And then I was like, damn, this is really good stuff. Reach back out to the company and I'm like, Hey, I have a small YouTube channel. Would you guys mind if you, you know, I could work with you and I haven't gotten anything really free. I mean, they've, they've done some customer service stuff for me. They swapped out. I had the nitride barrel for the cryo um, cryo barrel and they swapped yeah. out the cryo barrel for me, which was awesome. And then, you know, but I, everything else I've paid for from them and I love their gear. I highly recommend it, but I will say a lot of people now are kind of shying away from blackout defense, not because their quality control is not good, but they've gone from saying, Hey, we'll have your rifle ready for you in six to eight weeks to now all of a sudden it's six to eight months. And so, nobody wants to wait that long for a gun. You know? Yeah. Uh, 
I've waited. The longest gun I've waited for was 22 months. Woo! What and was so, it? A Dan so, Wesson? A Type A 12.5 Pro. Um, cost, it, it's custom. So, uh, more like how I've affiliated. Like, I shouldn't say affiliated, but the realtor that helped me move to Tennessee is 1911 Syndicate. Oh, really? I've been, like, the biggest fan of theirs since they got started. I think they have the best filming, uh, that crispy visuals, does the most cinematic stuff known to man. Everything's epic. I love their channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm tired of winter in Wisconsin. I want to get out of here. So I started looking, and they said, hey, we're realtors. I was like, I don't know anyone in any of these areas that I want to move to. So I called them up. Jake was awesome. Hooked me up with someone local here in Tennessee. And then he checked in the whole time while I was, like, looking at buying a house and all this wow. stuff. So I moved here. But those guys, you know, Jake did a video on, like, Type A. He was big into them. They did a video on blackout defense right off the bat. And they don't pull punches on reviews either. So it's like mm -hmm. if something's bad, they're going to let you know or they're they're going to mock it. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, because they make all their money on real estate. The YouTube channel is just marketing for their real estate uh, right. mainly, I think. But I, I can't speak to it. You know, I don't have their financials in, in front of me. But uh, so type A, I think it blew up the way that Blackout Defense did after a few people got it. And they're like, look, this is this is some top tier stuff. I ordered a type A. And it was like, I, I'm trying to remember how long it was quoted, um, but it ended up being a 14-month build. And I was new to the whole NFA thing at the same time. So I actually ordered a factory SBR, and it came in, and I go, great. I only have to wait 30 days now because that's what Form 1s are taking. They're like, no, buddy, you ordered it from the factory. That's a Form 4. So I was like, oh, like you're kidding me. So uh, – <laughs> to my fortunate, to to my uh, benefit, my FFL at the time got hit with, you know, these new, a lot of FFLs are being hit with these penalties for not crossing the T's, dotting the I's, right. that kind of thing. Yeah, the zero, getting, yeah. Yeah, getting taken down. So they actually lost their FFL. So I got approved for my Form 4 SBR in like 100 days. Wow. After After the 14 months. And so I got it, but I was so tired of waiting for it that I actually bought another Type A off uh, the broker that was an 11.5 piston that was used. So I was like, I, I couldn't wait. I got that. So I have two Type A's now. But, yeah, nice. I waited like a total of like 22 months from mm. ordering to being able to take it home. All right. Okay, we're going to swing back to the Type A stuff. Uh, do you want to start off, though, with your WoW account so you don't play WoW anymore? No, nah, no. Nah, I've played for, God, like 15 years. Really? All right, were yeah. you Alliance or Horde? Alliance, mainly. Oh, I was, I was, well, it depends. It depends. If I was playing a tank, I was playing Alliance. But if I was playing FPS, it was going to be Horde. Yeah, I play, I, I'm like basic where I always play like humans and things. So like okay. before World of Warcraft, I was big into Star Wars Galaxies was kind of my jam. Okay. And uh, I just played a human in that. And then I had a friend that was like, oh, this World of Warcraft game. I go, this looks like cartoony trash. I don't want to play this. And then Star Wars went through this like NGE and this makeover and it became an awful game. And switched over to WoW and started playing, I, I want to say, later in Classic. And then I went through WoW up until Dragonflight. And then I was like, I can't do this anymore. Being like, progression in that game is like a full-time job. I can't do this. There's With no Dragon reward. Flight. Yeah, there's no benefit. Right. I, I'm out. So. so, yeah, my wife and I played the expansion before Dragonflight. Which, which one was that? That was the one where the Horde and Alliance were together, and it was kind of like in the afterworld. What was the that one called? with the jailer. I'm trying to remember what it's called. Uh, Shadow. Shadow Realm. Shadowlands. 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 That was what it was. So we played a lot of Shadowlands. We played a lot of the expansion before that. I would say my favorite expansion was the one that was before that, where the Alliance expansion went towards like the pirate world, and then the Horde expansion went towards kind of like the weird, almost like Aztec world type thing. Oh, okay. You yeah. know what I'm talking about? We played a lot yeah. of that one. We enjoyed it. The Shadowlands was pretty good. I got pretty pretty high up with a uh, tank in that level. I was doing a lot of rifts. Um, or, or what are they called? Um, raids? Raids. A lot of raids, yeah. yeah. Thinking of a different game. 
but uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we played the dragon flight thing for like a week and then we just, we, we dropped it and that was it. We paid for it, both of us, and then dropped it. We haven't I think it. I did a, a few of the raids in dragon flight and then I was just like, they're like, hey, we got to hammer this on three different characters to make sure we know the boss fights to be progression. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not progression anymore. I'm out. Yeah. 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 I don't know. 2020 played a lot of Warzone, a lot of WoW. So... But, I play DMZ right now is the only thing I play. Really? Yeah. Do you, so, do you Call like of it? Duty, oh, Call of Duty DMZ is the only thing I play. So they don't have DMZ in the new Modern Warfare 3, but uh, I play a DMZ, which is Modern Warfare 2. It's kind of like the Warzone, but it's like you have like characters and you can take loot off other people and then you have to extract and there's like NPCs and quests and stuff like that. Okay. But mostly it just turns into PvP matches, but it's a little more fun, I think. Right. Because people aren't just hiding out until the gas type thing. Right. I, I'd agree with that. So Oregon Predator Prevention, no, I don't play CSGO. But let's let's tie the firearm conversation into the Warzone games for Call of Duty. Because how realistic do you think they've gotten now with the firearms in the Call of Duty franchise with all of the attachments that you can put onto it? Is it for, because you have a lot of guns with a lot of different attachments. So what is your thought yeah. on that? Like, where do you think the state of, of video games are with versus like actually going to the range and picking up a firearm for the first time? Because I did see, I think it was in like 2021 where they took professional war zone players and professional call of duty players and then put them into a real sim environment with the military and had them kind of do their own strategic planning and the first couple of, of like goes, they didn't do nearly as well as the military did with the strategic planning. But towards the end, once they started clicking the two together, it, it started to work. There was some, you know, bleed over yeah. from real military simulation into actually playing a video game. But how do you think the war zone or the, or the Call of Duty weapons are versus real life? I think, I think most of it's pretty, I think they're getting really, really accurate. The one thing that I, I, as an AK fan that I love and hate is like the AK and like 762 by 39 has that recoil. Like it's, it's harder to control in the game as it should be. Um, the one thing that I don't like is five, four, five doesn't get enough credit. I feel like in that game, I'm a huge, like if five, four, five was still reasonably priced, that'd probably be all I shoot. I absolutely really? love five, four, five, five, four, five to me is so pleasant to shoot. It's so much fun. I still have like, 2k where the 545 uh, wow. around here but like that doesn't get enough credit in those games versus like a 556 five, gun i feel like and then um the 9mm stuff it, they don't have the bullet drop right like i'm a big fan of battlefields um up until they they got pretty awful like the last two have been pretty bad but battlefield has that bullet drop dialed in and Call of Duty is getting there, but it doesn't have that dialed in. Like, I can shoot someone across a map with a 9mm, and there's not as much drop as there should be. Okay. Yeah. And, and all right, yeah, Oregon Predator Prevention, that is kind of cool that you're talking about the fact that an AK wears you out more than an AR. I mean, I think that's realistic, though, just in the real world as well. Um, it definitely will. But also, too, one of the things that I would like to see them actually start to incorporate is jamming, kind of like from Escape from Tarkov. I don't play Tarkov, but in Tarkov, you can get a firearm and it jams. I think that that's kind of a an interesting thing. I think that could be an interesting dynamic in future versions of COD where maybe you have to pick up a cleaning kit. And if your firearm gets super dirty and you don't clean it, uh, there's a higher chance of it jamming. Who knows? It's, got, it's a big throwback, but have you ever played Far Cry 2? Far Cry 2, man. I played some of the Far, Far Cry, Cry 2 series. had that. Like, Is you that would what pick it was? up a gun and the quality would go down. And as the quality went down, you might get a jam while you're shooting at someone and have to clear it and stuff like that. Like, Far Cry 2 had a bunch of that stuff, like, built in. Was that the um, one that was in South America? Uh, it was the one in Africa. Was, okay, I, I didn't think, play Far that Cry one. 2. Yeah. yeah, the South American ones were later, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, I played the one in South America. I played the whole campaign on that one. But, okay, so now that we kind of touched on, you know, our World of Warcraft and our, our Call of Duty, I do wanted to bring this back full circle because, you know, in Call of Duty and Warzone, you get to do a loadout, right? You get to yeah. build a loadout. Um, 
I, I want to talk to you because I love watching all the gear that you have. I think there's only one other person right now that's kind of like an up and coming YouTuber, and that's Black Rifle Medic, I believe is his thing. He's got, I, it's like every day he has a different suppressor. I don't know how he has that many yeah. NFA tax stamp things, unless he's like a class three FFL himself. I was going to say, he's probably got his own class three or, it, or He's got it. He's he got knows. it, man. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, you're like, you're up there with him as far as providing good entertainment with you know, fun to see firearms and also accessories. Um, let, let's go, let's go like this. Let's say, um, you know, ultimate rifle build as far as, you know, semi-automatic rifle build goes. We're not talking about like an SHTF situation. We're just talking about, excuse me, if you have unlimited funds, um, you know, unlimited ammunition, right? And access to all accessories and all rifles. What is like your dream setup? My dream setup would be a 12.5 AK, 5.45. And uh, this is going to hurt all the AK people, but if you shoot AKs enough, you know why. It would have the Magpul extended handguard on it because that's the only one I've found that doesn't get lava hot after like two or three mags. I would probably have a lead and steel Promethean as my dot on there. Love that sight. Uh, I don't envision myself ever having to shoot past 250 yards like for any type like there's no threat to me as a civilian that i should have to engage that far out right so uh i'm always looking at that 250 and in so it'd be something like that that would be my dream setup would be a 12 5 5 4 5 that i can afford to feed all the time and get ammo to feed it right so you're not worried about though with that then shooting it suppressed like in a subsonic. No, no I had I had a, a can on it. I had one of my Huxworks cans on it. I had a PSA AK-74 that I got rid of because everything went skyrocketing. And I was like, okay, I'm going to flip this and buy something for the channel to review because uh, I'm not going to shoot 545 now that it's 85 cents around. Right. Or, and barely available. So right. I did have a Huxworks can that I shot it with every time. So, yeah, it's... It's not as bad as suppress. And I'll say this. I've had arsenals. I had definitive arms. I had all these guns. But the PSA, you're going to get con – what? Well, it's going to be concentric out of the box. So to suppress it isn't as big a concern as if you get like a, you know, a European or Eastern Europe AK, and it might not be concentric, so then you actually have to worry about a baffle strike. With mm. something for PSA, you don't – it's going to be concentric, the barrel is. Okay. So you don't have to worry about the baffle strike part of it. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So that's like your dream rifle. I like what you said about like a civilian really doesn't have to worry about an engagement for yeah. like 250 yards. Right. I mean, it, you know, like in a legit SHTF situation, if you're like bugging out, chances are you're not going to be taking, you know, sniper shots at 500 to a thousand yards. You I've, know? Made, I've heard one good argument and it was Joe Dawson from Bruiser Industries. I was talking to him a little bit. He made the argument that if you can shoot long range, you can keep an enemy further back while you escape. Right. And that's actually a valid point, I would say, with, like, trying to get away. Me, I'm probably not getting away from much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, the 250 and in, right. uh, like, is, is my bread and butter. And the 545 recoils less than a 556. Five, like, you wow. can just rip those things. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a blast. Right. Yeah, I know. And I think that that's a big thing, too. Now, now we're going to jump into the SHTF builds, right? Let's let's, let's talk yeah. about a legitimate SHTF build. You know, talking about some sort of catastrophic event happens, whether it's a natural disaster, civil war breaks out, we're attacked by a country, um, you know, EMP overhead or something like that, and you want to leave your area and go to a safe zone with your family, uh, you might have to go through some urban environments, suburban environments, uh, in order to get there. So what what would your build be then in that type of situation and why? It's definitely going to be like an 11.5, uh, a DI, AR. So, I mean, take your pick, type A, blackout defense. Uh, I got uh, a lead and steel kind of Sons of Liberty Gunworks monstrosity I just built um, out there. But like an 11.5, because you're still that 250 and in. So like, the I did a video on it, but when like, shit hits a fan kind of thing. What you want to do, like the, the best way for success is to build a community. 
And if you're just popping off rounds at everyone at 400 yards, you're not going to build a community and they're going to figure out a way to ambush you eventually. So don't do that. <laughs> like, uh, so everything that's 250 and in, I can do with an 11.5, no problem. I ring steel at 170 with just a red dot. It, it's, you know, an all day. Like, so it'd be an 11.5 quality AR, uh, definitely quality. Just DI. As much as I like piston and stuff, the ability to just swap a bolt carrier. Like, you know, how many superlative arms bolt carriers are going to be laying around? You know, I know you got one, but and I got one, but trying to find it at a Bass Pro Shops ain't happening. You're on mute, I think. Yeah. Dang, that's a direct dig at the Big Timber Lodge, my ultimate SHTF build, because I'm using the the Blackout Defense, you know, rifle with the superlative arms retro piston kit. Now, to be fair and honest, right, um, I want to do an additional series because I'm, like, growing with this rifle that I have, yeah. right? And I'm learning what I do like and I don't like. One of the things that if, if I were to say, okay, if I'm, if I redid my ultimate SHTF build, starting from tip to tail, uh, tip being the, what goes on the end of the barrel, it wouldn't be a dead air Sierra five. If I'm, oh, if yeah. I'm, if uh, I'm, I, yeah. I would, yeah, I would, <laughs> I, I've seen enough on those. That would be a hard one for me. So I'm going to be testing, uh, some Griffin armament cans, right. I think down the road, I have Hux cans. I, I know some friends that have dead airs, like they have like the Sandmans or the Nomads. I don't know anyone with a Sierra 5, but uh, I'm also really interested. I want to try one of those cat, uh, like yeah. the white breads. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But, uh, I got a video coming out probably in a month, I think. I'll probably put it out. But it's, can a traditional can, can you tune it down far enough with one of those superlative arm pistons where it gets quieter than the flow through can? And so far, the answer is no. So my really? Hux can, I have a Resonator K, and I I have it one click on for gas is in. Yeah, yeah. And it's already got enough to cycle. And my little decibel meter on my phone, which probably isn't that great, says they're like within one decibel, and the Hux works is quieter. That's, that's, yeah. that's nuts. Okay, so first off, that's nuts because... I, I literally was seeing a internet argument the other day because one of these, you know, channels was reviewing, you know, what's the best type of suppressor for uh, an AR-15 chambered in either 223 or 556 at preventing gas blowback, right? Because, yep. and that was the thing. And they, they said, you know, obviously the, the obvious winner, because you and I understand this, was a flow-through suppressor. Yeah. And then there were people in the comments that are like, well, that's cute that you want to get a flow through suppressor because it's going to prevent gas blowback, but it's not going to reduce the, the noise and you're still going to have to wear hearing protection. And my argument to them was because I don't have an experience with a flow through suppressor in person, right? I, I understand the design from an engineering standpoint. I understand what other people are saying about it. I, I really, because I've had a lot of conversations with the folks at Superlative Arms, um, you know, with, with the retro piston kit that I've done, that if you get a flow through suppressor, it is only going to increase your back pressure on your rifle by about 5%, if that. And it yeah, it's pretty really, minimal. But in my mind, and I think in a lot of other people's minds, the fact that the gases are traveling down the barrel into the flow through suppressor back and then forth and they're cycling like a turbine, but they're still coming out the front of the rifle it makes people assume that it's not going to be as quiet as a traditional suppressor. But what I've heard from you and from other people that have shot the flow through suppressors is that they're actually quieter than a traditional baffled suppressor. So here's the thing. Where is everyone standing when you shoot a suppressor? Behind you. So a flow through is always going to be quieter at the ear, like nine right. times out of ten. I can't say always, but most of the time it's going to be quieter at the ear because, like you said, gas isn't coming back. So downwards, though, the the suppressor could be a little bit potentially louder, which is why if you go to, like, Pew Science, you'll see at the ear all these flow-through cans are winning, but, like, down, like, at the muzzle, they're, they're not coming out as far ahead right. in that. But I always tell everyone... Do I care if the other person hears it or not? 
<laughs> Not right. really. It's to protect my hearing. And I took my Huxworks can hunting with me in Wisconsin this last year. And um, what ended up happening is I shot at some deer that were running full clip, like 170 uh, perpendicular to me. So it was rough shots. I missed them. I took like six shots at these three deer. And my cousin come came up after the drive. He goes, did you shoot at anything? I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have fired, I fired shots, and he's like, I didn't hear it. Like, right. And this was, I had a 12, I had my 12.5 Type A with a Hux can, and I was shooting 5.56. Right. Five, well, all right, so we have Black Rifle Medic in the in the comment section. He was the one that I was telling you that he seems to have, like, more Class 3 stuff, attack stamp stuff than I've seen on, on almost any channel. So he might be able to weigh in on this a little bit because he has a really good understanding. But I think, too, with those flow-through suppressors, because this was something – I was talking about with Logan from Ninja and Flannel is that what I've heard with those flow through suppressors is that the rapport at like at distance at range is different than if you didn't have a suppressor or if you had a suppressor on. Yeah. And I wonder if that's because it's really directioning the, the, the gases that go straight out of the end versus like, if you don't have a suppressor on, it's kind of a, a omni direct, not omni, but you know, 180 degrees is a blast yeah. out the end of the barrel. Um, so I'd be interested to see what he says. Yeah, but, so Cat had a pretty good uh, video or like an explanation the one day. Uh, and I their social media is, you know, hit or miss. Uh, some people hate it. But basically what, what causes louder pops, you know, as well as when there's hot gas. So the, the, the point of it is you want to get the gas out and you want to cool it as quick as you can. So that running it through, you're actually giving it a little time to cool. Whereas, let's say you have a traditional can, the first like first round pop might be less, but as that gas builds up in the can, it might get louder. Right. It, or it might, you well, know. I don't know. So, I, that's an interesting. That's an interesting thing it's, to think. It's one about. of the things they talk about. I don't know. I know like some of the Pew Science stuff. I think they've referenced that. I'm not. I don't have enough experience, but that's what I've heard is that it's the hot gas you got to get rid of. If the gas is cooler, then it, is it's that now is that going to be with the flow through suppressor or a traditional baffle suppressor? So a traditional baffle might have a quieter first round because there's no hot gas in it. But after like let's say round six, it doesn't get the gas out the way that it needs to. Gotcha. Where the the flow throughs e each round, you're getting the gas out. Okay. You know. Okay. Whereas the, it's like stacking in the traditional right. baffle one, like maybe after three shots, that thing's packed with gas yet. And I'm firing another shot to put right. more in it. And then it gets right. louder. So, yeah. All right. So, and the, and the reason why I wanted to talk about this a little bit is if I were to redo my rifle, my SHTF, if I said, okay, my SHTF is definitely going to be a five, five, six or a two, two, three wild. That way I can use any two, two, three ammo or five, five, six ammo. Uh, I would love for it to be a 300 blackout, right? That's that's where I would love because I could shoot that supersonic if I needed to go hunting, right? And it would be easy yeah. to take like a deer. And if you only have to shoot one round, your rapport isn't going to really tell anybody, especially if you have it suppressed. Um, but realistically, for an SHTF, you know, situation, I'm going to be choosing probably a nine millimeter pistol and a 5.56 five, because the ammo is going to be in the most abundance, right? Yeah. Especially if you build a community, like you said. Right. Yep. But with that being said, I wish I would have gone with a flow through suppressor because Sierra five is a great suppressor at capturing the sound, but it it's a suppressor. It doesn't stop the, the, the rapport from the bullet breaking the speed of sound barrier or the sound barrier. Right. Yeah. You're still getting that supersonic crack from the bullet as it leaves the end of the barrel um, there, or the end of the suppressor. You're never going to be able to stop that until they come up with new physics you know, and change what the bullet looks like. You're well, never going to be able to uh, stop that. 1911 Syndicate just did a video with Ronan Arms on an MP5 where they did the integrally suppressed, and they actually fire 124 grain supers through it, but it's the barrel's ported, so it slows it down to subsonic speeds, which is really? wild. So it's you shoot supers in it, but they slow down. I don't think you could do that with 5.56, and it'd probably be a terrible wow. cartridge if it slowed it down <laughs> yeah, that much. Right. But, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that you want about the 5.56 is its, you know, penetrability 
at, at a high velocity. You know, there's certain speeds you want your bolt to be traveling if you're using a 5.56, five, you know, caliber round in order to ensure that it's going to do the correct type of damage, you know, at, at a certain range. You know, and I think what is a grand thumb talks about subsonic rounds, especially like with the 300 blackout, if you're shooting at a man sized target, you know, after about 200 to 250 rounds, it's going to kind of be, you know, if, it, especially if it's a short barreled rifle, an SBR that suppressed shooting subsonics, um, you're going to be losing so much velocity at that point. Is it possible to hit somebody? Absolutely. But once it gets pat or drops to a certain velocity, the, the fall off is such a steep curve that you're going to end up lobbing the bullets more out there versus, you know, shooting them at, 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 a, at a more predictable trajectory. If that and that's makes where sense. I've kind of changed my tone on 300 blackout subsonic. I consider it more of a range toy. Okay. Like I don't really like there's the bullet technology is getting there, but it's not there where it's like a rifle, a, a 300 blackout super does so much more terminal damage mm. than a subsonic does that, you know, if you were doing a home defense thing, like why would I want to give that much up? Right. You know, it's like plenty of people have five, five, six guns with cans on them for home defense where the 300 blackout, what appeals to me is the length you can do. So I can get full speeds out of, you know, eight or 10 inches with this and not sacrifice it. And if I do supers, I'm still doing rifle terminal ballistics right? Um, with it. Right. So I think I think if I would have gone with uh, like a flow through suppressor, I wouldn't have tried the retro piston kit because with the Sierra 5, it's yeah. such it's a dedicated 5.56 can that it does such a good job at capturing the gases. It makes so much back pressure that I, I get even with how tight the blackout defense rifle is, I get over gas like in my face, even with the retro yeah, piston oh, yeah. kit, there's no, you know, DI tube going backwards. That that's where the piston is. I'm still getting over gassed with the suppressor on. It's not nearly as bad with the, the piston kit, but I think my, my changes would have been swap to a flow through suppressor. Cause it's a five, five, six. Also, as you mentioned, if you're in your house, now that I'm learning with the, you know, flow through is directing the sound forwards. Um, it's going to be quieter for me if I have to shoot indoors. Right. The well, it depends on like your walls, you know, like how that echoes in your house. If you have a really echoey room, it's probably going to bounce around and hit you a little bit better, but it's still going to be way better than, you know, uh, like you'd get the same probably results with a regular can as well. Okay. So I think the flow through can wins on almost everything. Like okay. I'm a big fan of flow through, especially after the testing, because what I did is I have my type A with that superlative piston on there. And it's only one click in, and it's gassed enough that it runs. But like on my other one with the Hux, the, I get a better ejection pattern. Um, I get less gas even. Really? It, like when you have the flow through on those pistons, what you're trying to tune is recoil as well. So it gets really soft shooting with the flow through on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so that's that's one of the things that I found with the the retro piston kit that I have is that because I have the dedicated Sierra 5, I can't have the rifle tuned for the suppressor. So yep. where it's a, it's a, it's a you know, a, a legit three o'clock ejection pattern. Can't get it, yeah. Or four to five. No, I can get that pattern, but if I take the suppressor off and I'm shooting unsuppressed- It won't work at all. It won't work at all. It's, yeah. it, that's, that's the issue. I can tune that bad boy, and I did. So I got a standard weight buffer spring, but I ended up putting in the Odin Works heavyweight adjustable buffer and brought it up to an H2 weight buffer. And after I did that, now I can get that blackout defense with the Sierra five and the retro piston kit to shoot extremely soft with a fantastic ejection pattern. But if I take that suppressor off, man, then I have to make it like massive amount of adjustments in order to shoot it on suppress. And when I talk to superlative arms, they're like, if you would have gone with a flow through suppressor, you yeah. can actually tune the rifle for the ammo to shoot it extremely soft suppressed or unsuppressed and you don't have to make any adjustments so i think that that's one of the things that i would have done but I, realistically if i had the flow through i would have stuck with the di because you're not getting nearly as yeah. much back pressure and with the superlative arms adjustable gas brake on the di you can do the 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 bilge where it's not denying the gases it's expelling the gases out the front of the gas block and so that also helps with you know mitigating back pressure 
So with that's this one of the things I found on my 12.5 Type A when I I tried to tune it to bilge it off, but I was like I went all the way out and it was still it still had more gas in it than if I just did the restriction one. Wow. So I actually went to the restriction side and it's not blowing anything off, but it allowed me to tune it so that there's less gas coming back. I got the ejection pattern I want and the recoil still soft uh, with that. So I don't know how superlative arms does that because I thought it would be like the same both sides, you know, like right. the, the gas, but the restriction is where I'm at, where I've actually gotten the best results. I know that they warn you like, Hey, it may corrode your gun a little bit more or something like that. Right. But uh, I, I, I'd be fine with switching my barrel if it got eroded because of me shooting it as much as I wanted. Right. But one of the one of the things that I'm actually trying right now, this new build that I put together, like they got all these new gas systems, like Sons of Liberty has it. I'm doing this lead and steel, the HM monoblock, where it's an 11.5 or a 12.5, but it's got a mid gas on it. And so that makes it more like suppressor dedicated. Really? Yeah, so uh, there's there's a lot of guns where they're adding, they're doing the longer length gas, like Noveski, the the Slade gun, the irregular defense one is an 11.5 mid, and then uh, Sons of Liberty Gunworks has, I think, one of their 13.7s has like a longer gas, or like they're trying to do like, oh, it's almost like a dissipator type thing where it's got a longer gas length on it, and then you get a DI gun that shoots really soft. That was made for a suppressor, but it'll still run without one. And if you put a flow through can on that, then you're like in that sweet spot where you got a suppressed gun that's still recoiling. You don't have to worry about adjustments. It's just set, you know? Okay. That's that's pretty awesome. So Logan from Ninja and Flannel just asked, have you seen the trick where you make a gasket on your charge handle with RTV silicone to seal in the overgas? I have not seen that. I've so. seen that. I've seen people You've do seen that. It. Yeah, yeah uh, I've seen people like 3D print little inserts too for that. Right. Um, I have like a, what is it, the Reek Arms charging handle I just got. I haven't tested it yet, but it's the lead and steel branded one, but it's a Reek Arms, I think it's their Warhammer, where they actually have little channels for the gas to go out the side of the charging handle okay. Okay. instead of back at you, and then they got a bigger ledge in the back for that. Interesting. Um, I haven't had too much gas to the face. With suppressors, I've had it more out the, the ejection port, which I'm right-handed, so it's not as big of a deal. Right. But if you're a left-handed shooter, that's, uh, that's rough. something you don't want. Yeah. Right, that's, that's really rough. I mean, one of the things that drove me for this whole pursuance of less overgassing and uh, tuning the ejection pattern is the fact that on my blackout defense – I've got a Night Force Attacker 1 to 8 on the top, but it's it's mounted with the Badger Ordnance Condition 1. And then I have the attachment for the 45 degree off cant, you know, that I have in front of the ejection port. And when I first built it, I didn't have the suppressor. And I got beautiful, you know, Blackout Defense really knows how to tune their rifles from factory before you put a traditional suppressor on. They can't do anything about what I add to the rifle yeah. that creates that back pressure. And then once I put that suppressor on, my shell casings, because of the CR5, were ejecting it like a one o'clock pattern. And actually, it's just going to be a matter of time until a shell casing comes out at right the, the, the perfect angle yeah. and it's going to go straight into the glass. You know yeah. what I mean? And I'm like, all right, that's not that's not good. So then I started the whole, let's, let's try to figure out how to tune that ejection pattern back. Now, shout out to Superlative Arms. Even with the piston kit, I will say, without the suppressor on, with the piston kit and the rifle tuned properly, there's zero gas yeah. in my favor. Yep. See, in, my, it, in my face. It, it Zero. works. Yeah. Yeah. It like really you can does. Tune it just right. Now, what, and, is, and, what is your thoughts, though, about if somebody is getting into ARs, right? Um, you know, they want to they want to tune their rifle. What is what school of thought do you think they should be pursuing first? Buffer springs, buffer weight or adjustable gas block? I would say adjustable gas block because you just have more options. You can tune it exactly where you need to. Like uh, with the superlative arms thing, you have technically like 20 clicks each way. With a buffer, you have an H1, an H2, and an <laughs> H3. You know, it'd right. be if, if you're going, you know, it's like how Cheesecake Factory has like 400 pages of menu items. Like you could always find something. Right. Whereas, you know, another place only has 
three items. So I think the adjustable one, I'm really, I've, I've played with a few, but I think the rifle speed gas block, if you can get that, is where it's at. So Argos Ordnance, they do all their guns with rifle speed gas blocks. That's, uh, if you don't know, it's Chad from IV8888 and Air. Oh, really? They, they run Argos. And they have rifle speed gas blocks, and they were at IV 8888, you know, the range day, obviously, because they, they helped put it on. But uh, they had their Argos ordnance there, and they're all rifle speed. So it's like, I take my can off, I just twist it with my fingers, we're ready to go. Whereas, you know by now, getting that Allen wrench in there is kind of a pain. Yeah. Especially if you have a can on there, and there's not that much room in between. I'm yep. usually holding it up to the light to make see where I'm at. Because they also have that bleed off area that looks like a screw as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's the big thing too. Is you have, and that's what they warn me <laughs> is don't unscrew for the piston rod. Don't unscrew like the the, the piston the top rod. One. The top. Yeah. One. And thinking that you're unscrewing the you know the uh, or opening up the 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 gas bleed off. And luckily it seems like the top one has a different size and they, they were smart. It's a different size Allen key than the bottom yeah. one, but I could, and they said there's, there's recordings of people that think that they're opening up the, the bleed off valve and really they're just unscrewing and unscrewing the piston rod end cap, yeah. you know, and all of a sudden, finally they unscrewed it up. That it goes and shoots out through the back of their suppressor. And yeah. then now, now you're, you know, you're out of suppressor. So, and then let's say shit hits the fan or something like that. And, uh, you have to go and get a different suppressor. You have to take your can off. Right. Are you going to find a three thirty two wrench laying around? <laughs> that's that long yeah. that you can get in there. Right. Now you just, it's like that thing better be next to your tourniquet. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you yeah. know, if you're carrying something. So that's why the rifle speed, I could just take a paint marker and write a U here. Right for unsuppressed and just click, click, click. Right. And I'm there. And, yeah. And, that's, that's a great yeah. idea. Well, that's, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up was like in my SHTF video that I made the last one, part two, I talked about the fact that because I had the retro piston kit on there, I need to find some way to actually attach the Allen key to make the adjustments and also be able to take that, that piston bolt out. So, cause superlative arms is like, you need to clean this every 500 rounds which yeah. realistically isn't that much if you're having a day at the range. Yeah, I've shot a thousand a rounds in a day at a range. I know it was a heavy day, but I've shot it before, right? Yeah. Um, so you need to be able to take that end cap off to be able to clean the piston, which doesn't take much time. It takes like less than a minute to actually open oh, it. Oh, they tell you to clean the piston? To, yeah, the thread. So you, you open it up, drop the piston out, and then you clean the threading on it and then put it back in and then close it up so you don't get a Oh, I haven't off. ever cleaned mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I've never cleaned it. I didn't know that I should take anything. I didn't. I was yeah, like, I'm not going to touch anything with the piston. Yeah, I've no, never cleaned it. Yeah, man. Uh, and I bought it used. Okay. And, and someone definitely had like a chemo traditional can on it before me, and I've probably done probably five or six thousand rounds through it. Wow. Wow. Since then. So, so yeah, what, I've never cleaned the piston. Okay, yeah. So I just cleaned the bolt carrier. Right. Uh, I need I need to actually clean my piston as well. I don't know. Do you find that now with your YouTube channel that you end up shooting so much you clean your guns less often because you know you're just going to take yeah. them back to the range in like a week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's what the only ones that I guarantee clean after everything is like the ones that I'm using for home defense right. or carrying. Those right. get cleaned. Yeah. That's that's a very valid point to bring up but all right so back to the rifle build blackout defense do you have a gen one or a gen two i have the gen two i got one of the first gen twos that came out like i called them and there i was like hey is there anything you can do about the like uh i ordered and then like the next day they had a teaser with like a square magwell and everyone was like you know that i saw the only negative thing was like we don't like this magwell so I call them. I was like, "Hey, can I get the new Magwell?" Like, and they're like, "Your rifle's like almost finished already." And uh, they're like, uh, "How about this? There's a fifty dollar price difference. If you pay that, we'll we'll hook you up." So they basically built my rifle a second time. I think. Wow. Wow. Uh, and uh, they got me the Gen Two, and it was like right. one of the first Gen Twos I think that rolled off um, with so, things. So it's yeah, definitely heavy. Like that. Yeah. That lower adds like I'm trying to remember how much they said it was close to a pound. Somebody said, yeah, 
It's a lot of weight. They they yeah. are heavy, but I mean they they definitely feel like they're made well. I, yeah. If I if I had the option though, I would go with the Gen Two versus my Gen One. I love my Gen One. I'm not going to get rid of it. It's going to be like a collector's item. Yada yada yada. Yep. But you know, like anybody that collects guns ever actually sells them. Not really. It's typically your family when you pass away, and then they take it to a pawn shop and huck it for fifty bucks. Um, sadly, but anyways, I don't want to think about that. But with the Gen 2s, what I like, what I've seen, I don't really care about the squared flared magwell versus the V-cut that I have. But what I like is they have the reversible barrel nut. So you can run oh, the, yeah. they, you can run the proprietary blackout defense barrels, or you can flip the barrel nut around and run a mil spec barrel. I really wish I had that for an SHTF situation, just in yeah. case I ever lived long enough to shoot 15,000 rounds through my cryo barrel and burned it out. I needed to swap it out. And then the other thing that I like too is now that they're actually offering a forward assist. You know, do I think yeah. that a forward assist is a make or break? Not really, but it is just a nice option to have, I think, personally. And that's what uh, I see a couple of people like I've joked about. They're like, how do you do a forward assist? And it's like, you just put your thumb put your in the thumb ejection there. port. Yeah, yeah just push, in yeah. the ejection port, right. like on the bolt, there's that little cutout. It's like, if you don't have a forward assist, thumb will work. Right, uh, it's not going to be quite as good, but or you could take like a coin in that little. Yeah. Just, yeah, you know, and that's the only time though. Realistically, like when I was in the military, that we were trained. I did nine years in the military. That we were really trained to deal with like the Ford assist was if the bolt didn't actually grab the round to try to eject it, and then you would try to really send it hard home with the Ford assist. But aside yeah. from that, like if you had a malfunction or a partial feed, you would just eject the round. It was, yeah, just clear it. Just yeah. clear it. You know what I mean? You would you would you would clear it or drop mag clear and then put the mag back in and then recycle around or or cycle around back into the chamber. Uh the only time that we really tried to use like the, the, the Ford Assist was if the bolt didn't if it was like grimy mud in there and it didn't grab on, you know, to pull it out. And now that you bring it up, I, I think it, my SHTF that I would do V seven for the handguard, the receivers hands really? down. That, I have that V7 upper and 300 blackout, and, like, I'll give it to someone, and they're like, what's this? Like, it's half the weight. Right, right. Like, that uh, lithium aluminum is stronger, and it's, like, half the weight. That's crazy. Their stuff is pricey, but the people that know, like, like, I know Honest Outlaw uses their handguards a lot. I don't use the magnesium stuff, but the lithium alloy that they came up with, the lithium aluminum, it, it's a game changer. I wish I would have got a five, five, six one, to be honest, um, instead of the 300 blackout, but V seven is going to be on my list again. For okay. another build. Yeah, so for that's, sure. that's, so that's interesting. So like, if I'm looking at, you know, doing a, a newer educated version of a SHTF build, is that someone that you would recommend that I look at doing? Oh yeah. Okay. I, I would, I would do a V seven receiver, handguard, lower receiver, and then I would probably do one of these, like, because they have traditional gas uh, barrels. I would do, like, a, a 11.5 mid-gas or a 12.5 mid-gas for myself. Okay. But, you know, if you're if you're doing a 16-inch, their barrel's probably fine, too. But, like, you're, they have, you know, like, they built that 308 for John Wick. And it's like a 308 AR-10 that's under 6 pounds, I think. That's insane, dude. That's, so, that's crazy. That's like, so... <laughs> You know, it's kinda... If you're thinking about SHTF, you're probably walking a lot or carrying stuff. Right. To me, that makes a lot so of that, sense. So that does make a lot of sense, too, because of the fact that, you know, I, I hunt elk out here in Colorado. And several years ago, like four years ago, my buddy and I got all excited because Begara started making rifles that were becoming abundant in the U.S. And Begara's barrels had this, you know, really great repertoire or not repertoire, but reputation um, and so once they started dropping the rifles, we were like, dude, let's, let's both buy a Bagara B14 HMR and six, five Creedmoor. And, you know, and this will become our new elk hunting rifles, right? Cause we both had old school savages, 30 out six, you know, I have my savage weather warrior that I bought in the nineties and I was like, let's, let's do this. Right. And we got the Bagaras for like, I think it was like at a thousand after tax or something like that. So I was like, nice. dude, this is, this is awesome. 
right? B14HMR. We didn't even really look at the specs. We got these heavy full barrels, you know, these fiberglass stocks with the brazing cheek weld. And we finally Man, got it. Yeah, that bull barrel is going to, you're going to hate that. Oh, dude. After, <laughs> after I put like the burst scope on it, you know, the three to 15 yeah. burst scope and the Atlas bipod and the sling and a loaded magazine, this thing was like pushing like 12, 13 pounds. It was like ridiculously heavy. And I was just like, this is stupid. This is dumb. So I ended up saving up money. And like the next year I bought a weather or a weather B backcountry 2.0 titanium that weighed four pounds, 11 ounces without any gear on it. And then after I put a vortex LHT three to 15, um, it weighed 6.1 ounce or six pounds, 6.1 pounds. And I was like, this is so much easier to go hike around with as a rifle. But I think maybe it's the same thing with an SHTF. Like you, you talk about, if you have to be out on your feet a lot, you don't want to have something super duper heavy, especially yeah. if you're not getting to eat a lot or drink a lot, you're going to become malnutrition. You're going to become tired. If you raise your rifle up and it weighs, you know, 10 pounds. It'll take me a little bit longer than most people <laughs> to get, <laughs> to get down to that. But it's like, uh, if you think about it too, like how easy it is to whip a gun around. Right. Oh, that's a good like, point. Like a 10 and a quarter. I can 10 and a quarter that weighs five pounds. I'm whipping that. Right. But you got an 11 or a 12 pound, you're whipping right. around. Right. It's, it's getting rough. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. I'll definitely look at it. S S V is what you said or S seven V seven V seven. All right. Well, we'll message each yeah. other offline yeah. when, when I actually financially can afford to do like another build. Yeah. And then I definitely want to try like it's a, it's going to hurt your present. wallet. It's going it? to hurt you. Oh, yeah. God. They're, okay. they're probably one of the priciest. Really? Yeah. Like, like up there. They with... make, they make blackout defense look a little cheaper. Like really? It's, if you want to buy a whole thing from them, yes. But if you think if you find out the history of them is Joel Allen used to work for with John Noveski. Okay. And after you know his passing, they start. He's like, I want to get into metallurgy and I'm going to start my own company. So you got that kind of brains behind it, building quality stuff with new technology. You know. Okay. I right, definitely want to check it out. What are your thoughts, though, on semi-automatic rifles, right, that have, let's say, a internal MCX spear-type spring system, recoil system, so you don't need a buffer tube versus a traditional, you know, AR platform that utilizes the buffer? What are your thoughts on those? Hard pass and anything except a truck gun. Really? Yeah, hard pass. Uh, Why is that? Uh, Oh, well, there's this video that I I got uh, some flack making fun of it, but uh, I think she goes by Gun Vira now, but she was like Kothan Trust. Kothan Trust, yes. Yeah, yeah so she did about. a video showing off, um, what is it, the Law Tactical Folder, and she's like, you know, or and then uh, that Eric. So Law Tactical has that Eric, that uh, bolt carrier group that has the springs built into it, so you can run it without... Uh, you know, the buffer system. Yeah. Yeah. The buffer system. And when she was shooting at the gas, she was like shooting it at her hip and the gas was above her head, this cloud. Wow. And I was like, yeah, like I would love to shoot this over gas, terrible thing. And she went up and she took two shots with it folded and then unfolded it. And I was like, well, why wouldn't she just unfold it? Like right away. Like, right. like get, get quality shoulder harness, you know, three points of contact shots. So I think like the folding that's snapping it out, like the only spot you gain advantage is like if you're riding in a vehicle and it's like on the front of you, you don't have this thing like bumping right. up or right. if you've got to store it in something small like a backpack. So that's like, I, I did the law tactical folder, but the traditional law tactical folder with the buffer tube assembly. Or it's not going to fire unless you flip it, yeah. Right, absolutely. And then, and, and I did that on my Blackout Defense, my 13.9, because I can actually fold the rifle up now and put it into a computer laptop bag. Yeah. And, yep. and it fits in there. And, like, that was the one thing that I will say, taking walking away from this, if I'm building, like, an SHTF, and, a, and there's a chance that I'm going to have to go through crowds of people, but I don't want to let people know that I have an AR on me, then I do like the idea of a shorter barrel with a foldable stock so I could put it into a bag and it doesn't have to look like a tactical bag and it, it it's transportable. You know what I mean? Not, a, the, yeah. The, I would say that I would never go through crowds of people. No, 
Yeah. I, I would avoid going through a crowd. You can see anywhere like that herd mentality. If that changed on well, you, it doesn't matter what you right, have. So let, let, let's, and this, yeah. is, this is my thought on it, right? Let's say I live in Colorado, okay? Yep. And something happens, and Colorado now becomes a really sought-after state, and there's a war going on. Um, you know, civil war breaks out, right? And Colorado is like you don't want to be here. Okay, yeah. because a lot of the continental divide is here, and all the water that's on the west side or the western shed of the continental divide goes to Arizona, California, places like that. And so people are fighting over this this land, and I'm like, I gotta leave. I'm going to Texas. I got family in Texas, right? And Texas finally gets to build their damn wall on the southern border, but they also start building walls around the rest of the border as well, especially towards New Mexico and Colorado. Okay, you got to go through the big border gate. I've got to go through the border <laughs> gate, right? You That's know what fair. I mean? But, you know, I don't necessarily want to give up my gun or drop my rifle, but I want to have it with me. But at the same time, as I'm pre walking through, maybe I do want to be able to have it hidden. I would think like the Texas people would probably welcome you more if you had your gun visible. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, come on through. We need one more, you know, for the conscription of the Texas, you know, new world order type thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we got some people to respond to. Help me says, hey, guys. Hey, help me. Uh, what did I miss? Well, we talked about playing World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, Warzone, building out like dream rifles where you don't have a financial restriction, ammo restriction or access. And then we're talking about SHTF. Now, um. You know, I, I definitely will be pinging you on your expertise for building out a better, not a better, but a more educated version of an SHTF that kind of has that, a different. That's just, I guess, like, I think of, like, variables. Like, so right. a lot of, like, like science-y, like, okay, what, what variables can I encounter? And I just saw, like, Oregon Predator is, like, telling me that Oregon is the SHTF location. And I would agree that Oregon's... Uh, pretty nice but you know here uh the hills start singing country roads uh, i'm good so yeah I, I, tennessee right I, yeah. i'm in the very corner of eastern tennessee it's it's amazing here right. I, I absolutely love it the people right. are awesome well, and they're a hearty the, bunch yeah tennessee is kind of the oregon of the east coast i would say we probably got better laws right now oh, yeah uh, yeah and uh yeah like the things coming in yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually so, from Wisconsin originally, so my pronunciations are just terrible just because of my language. Are you a cheesehead, a Packers fan? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let's let's talk this and let's talk shop too for, let's say we have some listeners that don't necessarily own an AR, but they're interested in purchasing an AR, but they don't have thousands of dollars to spend. What are your thoughts on budget ARs and do you have any brands that you would recommend or brands that you would say, hey, stay away from this? And also, what are some accessories for the budget builds that you think are worthwhile or are just money pits that people, let's say, see something in Call of Duty and they're like, oh, this is awesome. What What yeah. are your thoughts? So the first thing is I, I would tell everyone go boutique. Um, and, and to say boutique is it's not high price. There, there's plenty of companies like I think like Munition Works. Um, you have Griffin Armaments, pretty reasonable, but like Psionics, you can get a gun from them. Uh, you can get uh, some of these Sons of Liberty gun works is pretty reasonable, I think, for what you're getting. And you can order it from a lot of these places now where it's like, if I'm going to use a can, I can order it suppressor tuned. Like they even have a, like you can call them up, I'm using this can, and they'll get that for you. And it's still going to be cheaper than most Daniel Defenses. Or anything like that like it's probably going to be around that bcm range you know and that's what most people get recommended right off the bat is the bcm i think uh psa is solid especially now if they come out with like that saber enhanced line i think that saber line is a really really solid what you get for what you pay is pretty solid they got great customer support that sort of thing they got solid warranties you're not going to go wrong there I don't know if you saw Reno May's recent video, but I'd avoid Bayer Creek Arsenal a lot. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What happened uh, with that? So Reno May did a video, and it was he bought two BCA 762 by 39 guns, and he got a total of 60 rounds through them before they both broke. Really? Yeah. It it was rough, um, and, and that was one that I was watching. And I see the question for Arrow Precision. 
the reason I wouldn't lean towards Arrow necessarily, like I said, I'm a Ben Stoger fan. He buys his Arrow guns, but he probably breaks a bolt like every two months. Really? But okay. he shoots, you know, 15,000 rounds a month yeah. or something like that. So it's, but he's got a BCM that's lasted him for X amount of time. And it's, you're looking at what, $200, $300 difference maybe Right. Um, with that, uh, depending on the sale of things. I, I think like that $1,500 price range is the real sweet spot where you're getting a lot of quality. But it's still reasonably priced. Right. Now, also, too, if we're if we're recommending a build to a first-time AR buyer, right, I would say if you're doing that, go more budget that's going to be geared more towards fun than worrying about SHTF. Like, yeah. go, go budget, get something that's going to be fun, something that you could try out cheaper accessories on, see what you like before you just automatically drop some serious cash. You can go fully budget and try out different length barrels and say, okay, what type, what length barrel do I want to have? Like my cousin um, bought an AR that had like a 20 inch barrel on it. And yeah. it was, but his thing was. My first was yeah. an eight. Well, I bought a 16 inch 300 blackout was my first one. Terrible idea. Yeah. And then I got an 18 inch gun on accident. I thought I was buying a 16 inch gun, but I was so excited to be at the Midwest industry shop that I didn't look. Um, so that was rough, but I think like it depends on your schedule of fire too. like the statistic, mm -hmm. how many rounds most people put through their guns. They're probably safe on a lot of those budget op options, including right. arrow. But if you're putting through 15, 20,000 right. rounds, then that's where that price jump up to that 1500 makes a big difference, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also going to depend on what the barrel's made out of and the bolt. You yep. know what I mean? So it, it, it's you look at Blackout Defense, they're like, hey, we have a nitride-treated barrel that's going to last longer than the cryo-treated barrel. But the cryo-treated barrel is going to give you better accuracy and yada, yada, yada. It's just what are you trying to build? You know, because... I think a lot of people get caught up with chasing smaller MO and trying to apply that to like an SHTF build. Okay. If you, if you're doing an SHTF build and the furthest you're going to be engaging somebody is 200 to 250 yards. If you could get a rifle that all the components on it are rock solid tank proof, nuke proof, and you're going to get a decent amount of rounds through it and you could shoot a one to a one and a half MOA group. That's not bad. Um, especially cause that if you're shooting one and yeah. a half MOA group with standard ammunition and it goes out to 250 yards, you're looking at a little bit over a three inch group, a three inch spread, a little bit yeah. three to three and a half inch spread, which minute of man is just fine at that distance. And that's what, uh, one of the things that's been coming out lately, I've been seeing stainless barrels that are going like 50,000 rounds. Yeah. Or something like that. So I know in the past, a lot of people are like, I only get chrome lined, you know, whatever. Molly barrels. chrome, yep. And the, everyone's like, stainless is for like match shooting only. But now the stainless barrels, the quality that's being made, I think you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting that consistency, that tighter pattern, um, as well as barrel life out of it. Right. So I might go like uh, stainless, like, I mean, some of these type A's that I've seen people have, they have 20,000 plus rounds mm. and they're not like keyholing or anything like that. They haven't burned out their barrel yet. Talking about burning out your barrel. It's one of the things that I love about the H and K's is the polygonal barrel that you find on the pistols and the longevity yeah. you can expect out of a polygonal barrel versus a traditional rifled barrel. I feel like in the pistol world, it lasts a long time. That, that's what my SHTF pistol would probably be a P30. Yeah, that's a good gun. Yeah. What caliber? Yeah. Uh, I'd probably go nine. Okay. Yeah. I've got the P3040 cal with the LEM1 trigger, and man, it's it's a great trigger except for tactical drills because that length of pull, or not length of pull, but the travel is so far and the reset is yeah. so long. I got the LEM in uh, my P30L. I'm going to send that into Langdon and get it done up with the flat trigger, the short reset, and then they get it down to like three and a quarter pound weight. Okay. It's pretty wild. Okay. Let me ask this thoughts on having a flashlight on your pistol. I think, uh, especially SHTF. Yes. 
Yeah. I, I think if you're someone who's 65 and you're home by 530, it's not necessarily a necessity. You know, like you're you wake up when the sun comes up and you go to you're in bed probably right when it goes down. You're probably all right. I think if you can carry with a light, you probably should. Right. If, if it's something that you're less likely to carry because of the weight of the light or the comfort or something like that, if you're going to carry more, then by all means, I would rather have you carrying something than not carrying because the light is uncomfortable. But holsters are getting so good now. Like, right. I. You know, I've only been carrying, I want to say, like, two and a half, three years. And I've been, like, trying the holsters. And comfort is everything with how often you carry. If that thing's cutting you to pieces, you're like, I don't want to do this. I'm just going to dinner, blah, blah, blah. Wow. And, yeah. May 30th will be my 10-year anniversary for having my CCW. Oh, wow. Or my CCL. Yeah. So I've been carrying for a, a hot country minute, you know, and, and not just here in Colorado, but other states. So, before Colorado, I was stationed in California, so there was no carrying out there. I, I open carried a national force, and I almost got smoked by a trigger happy state park police officer because he came across me and I had a gun on my hip, which I legally could carry. That's a whole other story for a different time. But I was down face dirt in the ground with a trigger happy cop with his finger on the trigger, and he was shaking. But that's a different story. But, uh, what what are some of the other thoughts, let's say, on red dot sites? What are your thoughts on red dot? Do you rock red Pro dot on red your dot. carry? Pro, Pro red dot. Okay. Big fan. Um I I think like the quality matters too. Like I know you've probably tested some of those Sileys. i I bought my Sileys. I think a lot of people got them mailed to them. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. Like I, I had one. It was actually uh, my first time with Jared from Guns and Gadgets. We went to the range, and I was like, hey, man, have you tried the Echelon? And I had the Siley Bear, which is like their acro version on the Echelon, and I gave it to him. He goes, uh, dude, it just turned off. <laughs> like after he shot a shot, and it was turning off and on each time. Wow. And then, like, I got home, and I found out, like, it just came with, like, a the battery cap was a little loose. Oh, so I had no. to tighten that down. Okay. But uh, overall, you know, like, uh, I'm probably, like, I'm sending some guns into Langdon to get done up and really be like my primary only type thing. And I'm probably going to throw Trigicon on them. I really, with my astigmatism, I like bigger dots, but that new uh, RMR HD that detects the light in front of things, I've heard the way that adjusts is just amazing. Right. And that's, so that's kind of funny. Ninja and Flannel, I don't know if he's still in the chat, but we did a podcast a couple nights ago, a live stream. And, and that's one of my big advices to people that carry is if you're going to have a, a red dot on your pistol, have one that has a photo sensor on it, meaning that it can adjust for the amount of light in the environment that you're in. And they've gotten a lot better. I have one of like the first trigic, first gen Trigicons on my SH build rifle uh, and it works, but there is kind of like a split second of delay a little bit of a lag before it will adjust. But, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is if you're at the, the shooting range and you don't have a self adjusting, um, you know, a red dot is as far as you say, Hey, you know, if, if it has, let's say 10 options from really dim to daylight bright. And you say, I like this option number five, right? Smack in the middle, right? That's what I like. That option number five is going to be completely different if you're in a shooting range that's dimly lit when you walk outside and it's, it's you know, high noon and the sun's out and it'll be completely different than if you're in a movie theater and somebody kicks in the back door and it's completely dark and you pull it out. It could cause issues. So now with these newer versions of Red Dots, they have a photo sensor that will you program it that I like this type of brightness, but then it will automatically adjust the brightness for the light environment around you. So that's a, a great thing to have. That's a great thing. And I highly recommend if people can swing it, try to look for a red dot system that has that uh, technology. And that's where uh, the hollow suns that have the auto adjust. I'm not a fan. I actually turn those way up because if you think about it, like if you like dry fire practice and you put that flashlight on, you still want it like 10 brightness to see through that flashlight. Cause there's mm -hmm. so much light coming out of there. 
And then it's like if I pulled it out during the day, that daytime bright, it's the same thing. And I always think of it, it's like what's the worst that can happen is like Rocky. I'll just look for the middle of the dot. You know, like that's a pretty good spot because with astigmatism already, right. sometimes like I see grape clusters and it's like as long as I look in the middle of those grape clusters, I'm usually on. <laughs> like, like okay. so I, I'm good to go. So that's quicker for me even with the astigmatism than iron sights are um, as far as lining it up. But one of the things that I always tell people too with the dots, like Stoger just put out a video about how many people buy a red dot and then they do things wrong because they look for the red dot. What you need to right. do is look at the target and when it turns red, go. Right, right. But like that dot occlusion training, that helped me get better with a red dot and better with iron sights as well. Now you're talking when you say dot occlusion for my listeners out there that might not know what that is. That's like covering the front of the red dot. Yeah. So you're forced to use both eyes because your dominant eye is looking through the lens, but it's taped on the other side. So the dominant eye is predominantly the one seeing the dot, but your left eye is open. And then so essentially you're seeing with your non-dominant eye through the lens or not through the lens, but around the lens, right? So you're talking yeah, so about it's like you're projecting the dot onto the target your left eye is looking at the target or your your non-dominant eye is looking at the target your right your dominant eye is looking at the dot and it projects it and it's almost like you just see the target with the dot on it and it works you okay. know interesting so ninja and flannel said for the prism optics for rifle the prism optics are amazing for people with stigmatism yeah i'm just not a fan of like the eye relief is yeah. what you got to what do you got to deal with? Luckily, primary arms, and I'm really waiting on it. They got like a new GLX prism that is like supposedly unlimited eye relief on their prism because otherwise you get those wacky prism sites where it's got the step and it comes back like three inches so that you can get like decent eye relief on it. And you always got to mount it towards the very back mm -hmm. of your gun. Right. And if people know, like, depending on your cheek weld, then you're having to duck your head to get down to that. Or else, if you have it too high, now you have to work on how your zero is. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. What do you carry, let's say, for... Um, or, or do you already have, like, mags preloaded for, like, an SHTF, like, bug out situation? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's, what are you loading up with? So uh, I got a lot of gold dots, the okay. 64 grain gold dots. I do have some M855A1. Really? Yeah. Um, a few of those, but mainly uh, I'm a big fan of like the bonded bullets. Oh, so yeah. like the 62 grain Federal Fusion, the 64 grain, and then otherwise going with like the 77 grain, like the heavies. But like for what a lot of people can afford to pack up the m193 is a solid round right yeah you know? i for for my bug out mags i've got some australian defense industry ss 109 62 grain okay so you know and it's 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 a steel penetrator core but that adi is really good brass really good powder it's sealed well you don't really have to worry about moisture getting into your ammo so i i like that stuff is it the most accurate um it's very accurate considering it's penetrator core I'll just say that, but it's not like you're that, going to be. That's where those AKs come in with the lacquered, yeah. <laughs> you know, the lacquered cases. Yeah. That five, four, five by 39, you know, like good luck getting that stuff to not go off. Right. Yeah, um, dude, that's so true. <laughs> it, it's in those cans that, you know, you could, you're basically, you know, stockpiling like seven and six in those cans. Um, so, yeah, I, I get it. I, I'm not a huge fan of what is it like the green tip? I think okay. is that the SS 109. Uh, so SS109 isn't necessarily a green tip. It's like a, it is a steel core penetrator, but it's not, it's not green tip. So, okay. um, green tip comes from military. They yeah, wanted to know. That's the original M855 just. Right. Base. And, and yeah. they used to dip the tips in green. So people knew that it was a penetrator core. Yeah. Right. Like that, like, um, you know, when you see any of those gel tests, like that doesn't do great in gel tests. I no. get like that you want it to penetrate and things like that. But a lot of those bonded bullets still do really well through like windshields and moderate barriers. Right. And then they still expand well too. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's a weird 
thing to think about if you actually did have to get into a combat situation, the fact that, you know, if you are going up against somebody that's wearing a tank top and that's it, you're going to want something that has good expansion, right? Like yeah. once it, once it makes impact. But if you're going up against somebody that looks like they have a plate carrier on, you're going to want something that's going to have good penetration, you know? So it just kind of depends on what, just what's aim, aim a little lower, <laughs> <laughs> aim, aim a little lower or, or depending on how GBRS group, I don't know if you saw that video where he's like, I wear my plate carrier down here. Cause it's more comfortable. There's yeah. still a giant spot up right. here that, well, you know, that, like if, yeah, yeah, man. I what was it? Uh, so what's that dude that has a hard on for Sig? Mike Glover, I think. Is oh it, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he just he did a thing with with uh, another guy. You know, they're they're former combat. Yeah, the the hip the hip swinging one, right? The hip swinging one, but also too, they were talking about that. You know, we've gotten so used to seeing in like tactical demonstrations to really control the recoil of the rifle. Everybody's like hunched forward like this putting a lot of downward pressure on the barrel, you know, and, and they're hunched forward in this position. But the problem is with that, what they said is, you know, in, in your mind, you're making yourself a smaller target. You're having better control of your firearm. But realistically, what you've done is now you've opened up this portion of your body as a huge target. And there's no, no. Ant, uh, that might be the there. only thing I agree with Mike Glover. Yeah. On. <laughs> is, is, and then what they said is, you know, yeah. you should actually be presenting your body, not yeah. turn to the side because you have, you know, soft spot here when you have body armor or bent over like this, because now you've opened up this whole area, but you should be pre presenting your body, you know, straight forward, shoulder squared. If you have a plate carrier on, well, because uh, that's, that's yeah, going to yes. increase the target size of your plate carrier. And then Slade, just in a general shooting stance, like Slade and John Lavelle both, you want to be, you know, kind of upright in that fighting stance where you can get, if your spine's in alignment, it's a lot less strain than mm -hmm. that leaning forward stance. Right. Um, and I mean, stances have come so far in like 10 years, you know, back when people were pistol shooting and Weaver right. or teacup and all that stuff. And, and things have gotten better with what they've learned. So it's, you know, if it if it makes sense on paper, it's usually right. Right. You know, like, absolutely. What do you think about risers on AR platforms like high risers to get the the red dots way up high? Um. So I use a little bit of a riser, but it's like as long as you know your zeros and you're effective quick with it, I don't see an issue with it. But if you're just throwing it on there, um, and it depends on your face. I got this giant head, like. I don't want to duck my face. Um, right. So I need a little bit of a riser, but with nods or anything, you're definitely going to have a riser. I'm for it, but you got to know how your gun is sighted in, like at what distance and that trajectory. Right. Because if you don't have that dialed in, you could be off by four inches at 250 already, you yeah. know, or something like that. And then if you got a, let's say a three MOA gun, depending on how that hit is and the ammo, you're off by eight inches, which could be a big deal. Right. I think I think if I'm running a traditional LPVO, I'm gonna want it lower on the rifle. I'm gonna want oh, it. Yeah. I'm gonna want it. You know, where I have probably like a medium height set of rings to hold onto it or base, uh, just just for distance engagement type stuff. But I think the idea, you know, behind the risers with like a red dot because it's also preventing your head from creening over if you're in like a CQB type environment and you can have more of an upright position with your head, that it's also going to help keep your peripheral stereoscopic vision going this way versus this way, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it's going to help with situational awareness when it's all around you. Um, I, and also the other thing that I could see it being a benefit for is if you're running traditional nods, um, it, it's going to allow the you know optic that you're looking through to be high enough over whatever IR laser that you have on, on, on the barrel. Yeah. You know, especially if you're running a traditional white light on like, let's say the left side, the, the, the non-dominant side, and then you have, you know, some sort of IR laser on the top, then, yep. you know, you're going to be able to get up and over that. If you're running like a traditional red dot. That's system. one of the things too, is sometimes you can mitigate the need for a riser by putting like a red dot forward with an LPVO and like uh, something with eye relief, you can't really get around that. You're probably right. going to look at a riser. But I feel like some of these companies have tried to create problems that don't exist in order mm -hmm. to sell things oh, that 100%. you don't need. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, 
And that's what I, I'm going to have a video coming out where I bought, you know, just like an Amazon knockoff of a Unity riser. It's doing pretty well, and it's about, you know, a fifth of the cost. Oh, those Unity risers are like $100 at least, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Let me ask you this, though. What type of self-defense ammo are you running in your carry pistol? Uh, I choose either HSTs yep. or I have Underwood Extreme Defenders. Really? Okay. Is that yeah. the external hollow points? Is that like, uh, a, is that like I, I a G9? Think, yeah, it kind of looks like a screwdriver with... Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. 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 Especially to... Um, so, like, vehicle stuff. Those things, like, any place where you might have a barrier... Mm -hmm. the underwood makes more sense to me uh and, and i've seen you know i've i'm just a nerd with that stuff where i've watched so many ballistic videos where they're doing they're doing work yeah. and i've seen uh my cousin actually shot a deer with a 357 underwood <laughs> extreme defender and it did work it I'm did sure real it did. work yeah. and uh so i was like okay and and just some of that stuff, you know, take, have some fun. If you got like a public range or a home range, get a ham or something, test it yourself. Mm. You'll see some results. I think usually yeah. that's, I, I like that. So I, with my, um, you know, I typically for my EDC lineup, I, I have either the Glock 43 X or I'm running a SIG TAC ops. Um, with the SIG, I'm running just SIG, you know, ammunition, but, and then with the Glock 43 X, I'm typically in the pistol running HSTs. But with both of the pistols in my backup mags, I'm running those G9s, like the that Underwood, you know, extra yeah. hollow points for barrier penetration. Because yeah. of, if I get to a point where I'm concerned about barrier penetration and it's not just an immediate draw really quickly, point and press and pull, then, then I'm going to probably have time to drop my, whatever mag I have, load in my, my more barrier, you know, penetrating rounds if I have to. Yeah, that's what the only thing. And, you know, I say stay away from them just because I feel like I've scoured every single ballistics, like TN outdoors, shooting the bull, all these guys, yeah. you know, uh, it seems to me like Hornady, the critical duty and critical defense are the only ones that have hiccups. Like, it seems like it's right. It's either great or it's terrible. Like the consistency right. isn't there. Whereas if you look up HSTs or Underwoods, every single one has like the same results. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very consistent. Well, so I yeah. was lucky enough back about 13, 14 years ago uh, when I was in the military and I bought my P30 and 40 cal. I got yeah. a shit ton of surplus FBI 40 cal ammunition that the feds were using. And it was white box HST. It's what it was. Yeah. So it was government issue HST and yep. I got it for dirt cheap and I still have a lot. And then I started like looking into it. Why are the feds choosing this? And it's because of the consistency with the expansion out of, out of, you know, the, the percentage of the consistency is a lot higher than what at the time they didn't have underwoods, but almost any other, you know, there was some gold dots, spear gold dots were pretty yeah. good. Um, but yep. the, the HSTs were, you know, consistently better. Yeah, uh, and, and that bonded makes a big difference with the whole jacket separation, which like too, you see the FBI and their their rifles, they carry that trophy bonded bear claw, which is just federal fusion. Yeah. You yep. know? Right. It's right. pretty much the same thing. Right. And and also too, I watch uh what is it? Not Kentucky Ballistics. I forget the name of the guy. Uh he's like another Arkansas ballistics or something like that. I forget what his name is, but um He I bet he's the T N guy. He might be. He might uh, be. Or I'm trying to remember but he does a yeah, lot of I know who. He, tools he does, and targets, tools and targets. Oh, I, I like tools and targets, but no, this guy's yeah. a smaller channel. He's got like six, 7,000 subs, but his thing is, is he likes to just test the ammo and yep. he looks at, okay, what are the specs for this ammo? Right. What for, you know, what length barrel, how, what's the velocity supposed to be and what is the result supposed to be as well? And so that's what he likes to do is set up, uh, you know, a chronograph, shoot it through the chronograph with like multiple pistols, see how it responds with the expected FPS versus the actual FPS. And then how does it respond to, then it'll set up a, a ballistic gelatin block and then shoot yeah. that. And that's like his whole channel. And it's really fun to watch. And a lot of the times, a lot of ammo manufacturers are blowing smoke up your butt. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. With the velocities, velocities, uh, expansions. Yeah. That's where, you know, Paul Harrell got his bread and butter is, 
you know, hey, let's just shoot this ammo, see what our consistency is, see the velocity between these, and then let's shoot the meat target with the simulated, you know, lung right. tissue and ribs and everything like that. Love that channel where you get to see, like, hey, how does this go through ribs and how does it maintain things and stuff like that? Because I, I think, you know, ballistics gelatin obviously has its place and it's the standard, right. but there's not bones it's bouncing off of. Right. There's not things like that in there. And it's interesting to see how that goes sometimes with a bullet or what it does when yeah. it hits that stuff. Absolutely. What is it, what is it going to do? Is it going to immediately fragment out into thousands of little pieces? Yeah. Is it going to retain weight and get, still get good penetration? Is it going to deflect? You know, yeah. that's, that's a really good question. Um, I've got some really crazy 30 out six ammo in my house that I bought when I lived in California. It's some Barnes MSX. Oh, the and Barnes stuff. Yeah, the solid copper stuff is, so is this, getting up there. It is, but it was before it was solid copper. It was a solid copper round. So they made it when California back, I think it was underneath um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think he was the governor of California. They banned lead ammunition for yeah. hunting in half of the state where the California condor was. And so Barnes came out, and I think it was called an MSX or an MRX. I can't remember the name. They don't make it anymore. But it was a copper bullet that had a tungsten. Oh, wow. Because when they, yeah. when they first started messing around with just solid copper bullets, they were having issues with seating depth because copper is so much lighter than lead that when they got rid of the lead, all of a sudden the bullets went from being like this long to all of a sudden they're like this long. And they were yeah. having issues, and they're like, well, what do we do about this? And so they tried out a tungsten core with with the um, the copper, and I have some of that, and that stuff's pretty wild. But they don't make it anymore. Yeah, I I could see why they don't make it anymore, but I would love to see how that that would do because that sounds like a pretty amazing bullet because you're getting the expansion and then that tungsten's pushing it through, probably whatever. Yeah, yeah. So know? back in the '90s, Norma used to make a failsafe round that Winchester used to load into their ammunition into their premium big game hunting ammo. And it was called the Winchester fail safe, but it was actually a fail safe round from Norma. And that actually had, it was like triple material. It was a copper jacket, lead core with a tungsten rod pushed through the lead core just to ensure that it got really good penetration through elk, moose, brown bear, and stuff like that. And I, yeah, I, I shot that back in the day as well. That's the thing too. I think like people have to make sure that they test all their self-defense ammo because I've bought, you know, like for deer hunting or something, some of that Winchester deer season or the, like the Browning ones where they have like a larger ballistic tip and stuff like that. And on a gas gun, if those, those plastic tips get caught on feed ramps sometimes and it induces a malfunction, I've had a few of those. So I don't use anything with that ballistic tip really anymore in gas guns necessarily like the hornady one's a little bit smaller mm -hmm. but like i know like the winchester deer season has a really big like plastic ballistic tip and if it catches just a lip or anything when it's going out of the mag sometimes it'll bend off and then you gotta it's not going into the chamber you know right yeah that's that's a oh. very good point there's uh so a company that i like to shoot i think they have really great ammo they're out of nebraska they're called mead industries and i've reviewed their ammo before with my Loki weapon system, AR 15, it's an 18 inch barrel, but it's an aftermarket Saturn icicle barrel. And I got 0.4 MOA groups oh, with, wow. with their meat industry, 77 grain ammo. And I've talked to the manager out at their, their ammo plant. And he was saying they were going to start making some like two, two, three, like 80 plus grain ammo for two, two, three. But he was saying that, the bullet is going to be so long you can't use it in a semi-automatic platform. Yeah, the, the seventy-seven. That's what some yeah. of those. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like some of those burger rounds. Have you ever seen those that really stick out really far? You can't put them yep. into a traditional, you know, box-fed semi-automatic because they just won't work. So, yeah, and that's and, where like the three hundred blackout sometimes. You know, the difference between a one twenty-five and a two twenty, like how that feeds. Sometimes it can get wild on how it hits a feed ramp or something like that. And you got to make sure you just test all that stuff, you know? Right. Do you use, uh, for your 300 Blackout, do you actually purchase 300 Blackout magazines or do you just use typical 5.56 five, six? I bought bulls? 300 Blackout Lancers, okay. but it was more so that I know the difference okay. <laughs> uh, to avoid, you know, like if I'm at the range with a friend, the clear Lancers are for this gun, the mag pulls and then the 
USGI gun, aluminums or steels mm-hmm. are for this gun. You know. All right. Well, all right, Randy. I, I did you bring anything for show and tell? Because we yeah. will have to. Well, all right. Well, we got to take I that. Bring some. We yeah. got to take that offline though. Once once we yeah. we get to the show and tell portion, which we'll continue to record with the Riverside app, and then we can see your awesome show and tell stuff. But before we get to that. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a fun little segment because I really do think you have a lot of experience with the whole, you know, very large array of different firearms and accessories and calibers. What are some pitfalls you want to tell some people to stay away from as far as, you know, steer clear of these brands, steer clear of these calibers, or maybe these accessories? Um. Oh, this is rough. Uh, so, I mean, the big thing right now is the mantis dry fire system or the mantis training system. I just did a video on that. Avoid that thing. Like the plague, like it's why it's uh, so in my video, I showed that I pulled the trigger four times, but it counted it as 10 trigger pulls. So like things that I think are more accurately at measuring are like the suspenders that are tape measure or more accurate than that. The government all like it didn't measure <laughs> anything correct. And then I took it to the range because I originally bought it to like measure recoil so that I could put like, Hey, this gun has this much recoil or this much muzzle rise for my reviews. But I put a ramjet on a gun and I know there was less muzzle rise exponentially less, but it was saying I got way more muzzle rise. Like it can't really? measure anything correctly. Okay. I feel like, or it's hit or miss with that. So the Mantis dry fire system is one thing that like you, you can dry fire for free. Why, why you gotta buy something? Right. Um, so that that's one thing, but uh, for me, uh, God, I, I'm I'm not a Sig fan, okay. I guess. Okay. And the 365, I can kind of get on board with, but what I've encountered with my kind of experience is these boutiques like Sons of Liberty Gunworks or Griffin or Blackout Defense or Type A. If I have a customer issue, I'm on the phone with them in 10 minutes almost. Thanks. You think Sig's picking up the phone for me? Right. Yeah. Like it, it ain't happening. Yeah. So I will I, say, I, think- I will say though, just to toss us out there, um, one of the big, big macro brands of firearms that actually still has great customer service is Glock. So yeah. but a lot of people don't know that because Glocks are pretty damn reliable out of the box. Yep. I somehow got one of their Glock 43 X lemons and within, you know, a day of, of at the range the next day i called glock and they're like send it to us for free yeah and within three weeks they had it back to me and fixed and that was it and so yeah. you know i had to pay shipping and that was it shipping to get there and then they paid the shipping to ship it back to me they still that's have what... fantastic customer service but i think that's because customer service is just sitting around on their ass because nobody really has issues with the clock well with the with the shadow systems i got one in a trade where someone over torqued the optic screws so when i went to take them out they cracked so they were cracked in there. I reached out to Shadow Systems. I go, look, this guy botched it. They go, send us the gun. They gave me a slip. It was back with me in seven days, taken care of, no cost. And it was complete user error wow. on that. And, wow. and, like, that's where it's like some of these companies, the customer service is what you should really look for. Right. Because there's always there's always going to be a lemon. No one's perfect. Absolutely. And people, yeah, yeah. people had a really hard time. That actually was kind of what kickstarted my whole YouTube career was I, I did a watch before you buy a Glock 43 X series. And it was like a six part series uh, that started off with episode one, which I really didn't expect it to be as big as it was, but it was just me at the range the first day at the range. And I had like three malfunctions, no four wow. malfunctions and like almost a little over a hundred rounds. And they were three different types of malfunctions. And one of them was a major malfunction that was, really hard to clear. And I was like, all right, I got to send this back. And the, the amount of hate that I got, and I was never negative about Glock. I was positive, you know, Hey, I just got a bad gun. The amount of hate that I got in my reviews or my, my comment section was insane. Oh, it's user error. You're the type of person that gives gun owners a bad name. You shouldn't be able to own a gun. Glocks don't jam. It's your own fault for using bad ammo. Blah, blah. And I was using Winchester white box. And the funny thing was, is I sent it back and then I did a part two when I got it back from Glock 
and I didn't have any issues. They fixed it, but they sent me back a target and they put used Winchester white box, 115 grain ammo. That's what they fixed or shot it with after yeah. they fixed it. And I was like, see guys, it's not the ammo. The pistol had some issues. Do you get a lot of hateful comments in your section? Uh, I get some hateful ones. Uh, it's usually they didn't watch the actual video. Like they just saw like a part of it yeah. and then immediately spouted something off. But there is one company actually now that I think about that I would avoid uh, as well. Triarch. Triarch. The Triarch stuff. Like if you go on Reddit and you look at the Triarch horror stories, there's people that have been waiting like I think like 36 months for a gun mm -hmm. and they never get it or they got it at keyhole right from the start. Um, so Triarch, Triarch was one of those companies that when they came out, they, they had a lot of hype around them. And I think what happened was just the rapid expansion. You can't keep the same QC that you had, or they didn't hire enough to make sure that the QC kept there. But the the Triarch stuff, I've just heard of these wait times. I've seen so many videos where they've had issues. They have a bunch of, they started getting a bunch of, you know, like law enforcement contracts. And that's where when you start getting those, the civilian market, you're just, I don't care, you know? Right. Right. Um, with some of that so well, that's that i think that's kind of a big thing and like i don't want to talk bad about sig i mean oregon predator prevention just talked about the gun community is tribal as oh yeah they're definitely yeah. tribal. and i criticize sig in the comments and people lose their minds i went to high school and he's still a really good friend of mine and we talk about it and he is very high up with sig and he's like in charge of international military sales you know and and uh but i still i'm completely honest about my sigs my wife carries a SIG XL Rose P365 and, yeah. I, and I have the TAC ops in my daily rotation and I'm completely honest about it. I can see why though with SIG people would have hesitation and I'm honest about it because one, it seems like SIG doesn't like to do uh, quality control with new products or new innovations. They like to guinea pig test on the civilian market. And they're like, let's create something new, which is cool because you get to see innovation, but then they put it out into the civilian market. And then yeah. once enough issues happen, then they're like, oh, okay, we need to change this, right? Um, yeah. And that's that's kind of well, where that's I where, can, Yeah, go ahead. The 365, I wouldn't have hesitation on. I'm good with that one. It was like, I remember like the 556 Russian that they came out with that shot <laughs> 762 by 39 had a ton of issues. The 320 had, you know, obviously a bunch of hiccups. And then even the spear, what I don't like that they do is they almost discontinue support. Mm. So if you bought it when it was like the original Virtus or whatever it was, yeah. hey, you got a different handguard. You got all these different things. We don't support that any longer. Good point. And then now you got the MCX and it's like, hey, we've moved to the spear now. Yeah. Like we don't, we're not supporting those right. things the way we should. Right. So Which is it's like. They, they change too quick for things. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, if you look at HK, Hey, we've had the same VP nine for like 15 years. Right. Like we haven't changed anything except an yeah. optics plate now. I know. I remember when I was, uh, I had my P 31st and then I was like, Oh, I guess I'll tr move up to a P 2000. And then that was a very short lived gun. It seemed because then yeah, the v yeah then, that one. Yeah. Then the P the, the VP nine SK came out and I was like, that's what I'm going to end up getting. And then I ended up buying that used. And the guy, I don't know if you've ever messed around with the VP9 SK, but the insides of that thing is a I lot. Don't, I'm never going to touch the insides on an HK. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It's, I'm going to send it off. It's like neurosurgery. I mean, you better you better be like a brain surgeon when it comes to messing with, a, with an HK. It's ridiculous. And the previous owner tried to put in like a lighter weight trigger spring or something like that. And he completely effed up the gun. And to the point where... There was multiple issues, but the major issue that I was getting was that the slide wouldn't lock back. And then even with that, people are like, oh, you're accidentally pushing down on the slide release. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, it's not yeah. that at all. And I sent it off to uh, HK. They refused to touch it once they got it because they're like, oh, this has had aftermarket parts put on it. Yeah. We, we won't honor the warranty. Sorry. So they sent it back to me. And then I ended up sending it out to Oregon. And I had like a lone wolf trigger system. I think it was lone. Lazy Wolf. Lazy Wolf. Lazy Wolf trigger. Yeah. Fantastic. With the nickel yeah. boron coated trigger, you know, uh, yeah. all that stuff. Fantastic trigger. But he couldn't even figure out the slide issue. And I got it back. And then I finally found a gunsmith here in Colorado Springs that 
spent a, a hot minute on it, figuring it out. And then he finally figured out what the issue was. And um, he's like, yeah, this was just operator error, putting it back together. And yeah. So, that's what like some of those, like I, I, I've, I've talked with Reed Hendricks a few, you know, like uh, definitely. And I love his videos and he goes into, Hey, if you're going to bring a gun to my class, I don't really want a user modified handgun or something like that. Like send it. Like if it's an HK, I'd probably send it off to Langdon or Tufel Sun tactical or someone that like I work with HKs. That's our, bre- you know, mm-hmm. we do this. Like we're an HK shop. Because they're going to be able to, one, get parts and service it the way that it should, probably. If I just took it in to, you know, Joe Glock, he's going to be like, what's all this stuff? Right. <laughs> like, You know, like, I, I want someone specific. And it's the same with, I'm a big fan of the Beretta PX4. I'm not going to send that off to just, you know, a Glock armor if I right. wanted a trigger install or something like that. But on a carry gun or something like that, I'm going to get it professionally installed. I'm... You know, there's just, just, right. I'd rather trust it than not trust it. And then I'm going to put it through its paces when I get it back too. I have a good gunsmith here in the Springs that I use. Shout out to Harless Precision. I don't even know if he watches my channel, but he actually went to Trinidad State College in Colorado, which was one of the first schools to actually offer a degree in gunsmithing. And that dude's got oh, wow. like, he's got a whole team that works in his shop. He has a, really big, you know, warehouse shop that he does all the work in, but that guy knows his stuff, you know, and and I trust that man. And anything that I'm going to be carrying, even if it's something like you said, that I could do myself, if I'm going to put my life on the line with it, then I want to make sure that it was installed correctly, but also that he understands what the tolerances should be of the aftermarket parts to ensure that they're within the tolerance that they should be so that it's not going to end up costing me my life or somebody else that that's with me. Yeah. That's what I see way too many people at ranges and stuff where they're like, Hey, feel this trigger. I put in my Glock and it's like a pound and a half or two pounds, something scary. And it's like, you right. probably negated like two safeties to get it to this. Right. And they appendix or, carry it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like, they're, it, they're it's appendix. a little rough. Yeah, They're yeah. going to end up shooting themselves. You know what I mean? So uh-huh. um, there was a guy a couple of years ago that was putting his kid into car seat in the back of his truck. And when he was doing that, the shirt kind of came out of, of, uh, and it started to pull his Glock out and he had an aftermarket thing done. And when he went to put the, the, the pistol back in the holster, he like slammed it in and, um, it ended up the, the, they had gotten rid of so many of the safeties that it ended up slam firing it pretty much. And it shot himself in the femoral artery. He called nine one one, called, called his wife and bled out before they could save him. You yeah. Know? So and the way that I bring it up to people is like, okay, a 1911 has like a three and a half pound trigger. Would right. you carry a 1911 cocked and not locked? Right. And most of the people will be like, no, that's terrifying. Well, that's what they're doing when they put like a a two pound trigger in a clock and then carry it. You know, right. like there's probably not much travel to those triggers. No. You know, some no. of those flat triggers. It's I, I'm I'm happy with like the three and a half to even six and a half. Right. Um, in that range. Right. Do you, do you have so speaking of triggers, do you have like an ideal range or a weight for like a rifle versus a handgun? Uh, I mean that blackout defense is hard to beat. That zero trigger yeah. is wild. What I weight think are you my, running though? Are you running I the think, three or the four and a half? I think I'm running the three. Ah. Yeah, the- on a rifle, like I'm flipping that safety off and I'm going and then flipping it back on. Um, so I don't have as much concern with a trigger weight there. And it's the same with like an AK. You're sweeping that safety, you know, like you're aware and then you're sweeping it back on where all of those have safeties that you're putting off and on. Whereas, you know, when you get into these striker fire guns, you're not putting anything off and on telling it when you're ready to go. So you know, it's like, would you carry an AR without a safety? Probably not. No. Like, Definitely or you, not. would you carry it, like, you know, ready to go? Right. Like, probably not. Now, did you go with the flat face, the curved, or the hybrid with your blackout? Uh, hybrid. I went with the hybrid as well, but it's the four and a half. I wish I would have gone three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what, uh, there's like certain guns that I hear go three, and that's what, I want to send that P30L, LEM in a Langdon, and the 1911 syndicate guys said, like, go extra light. 
but that makes me a little bit nervous right. with how light it is. Right. So I might go just light on it. But uh, yeah, and, and I mean those Walther PDPs, those triggers are absurdly good, and they got that new PDP Pro trigger. That's like right on the border for me, where I'm a little bit nervous, maybe just because I've carried, I'm newer right. to carry, right. and that sort of thing. Um, but they're amazing triggers, those right. things. Like Walder has the trigger game figured out. It's it's crazy to me too, because like I have some friends that are gunsmiths and whatnot, and they'll do it for people. Which I, I don't know if there's a ethical thing behind it, but for like range rifles, right? They call them range rifles. They'll do a sub like you know, pound, it'll be ounces. It'll yeah. be like four ounce triggers. You know, we're not talking pounds. We're talking ounces, you know, like right. as soon as your skin touches it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And that's, that's the thing is, is you have to be really careful with those types of stuff because you get it down so light. It doesn't matter if there's still some sort of safety mechanism in there. If you hit it hard enough, you'll just get enough inertia that will pull that trigger back and set it off, you know? Um, and then the reset um, that they've been getting. So I got the Tesis PX9, which is a really cheap, budget-friendly gun. And the trigger on that is absurd. It was like three pounds, had a really short reset. I was at the range once, and I was shooting, and a second round ripped off yep. when I was just meaning to take it back to the wall again. Right. So it was like, okay, this is almost lighter than I would carry. Yeah. You know, or or the reset on it was pretty right. pretty wild, but those guns are surprisingly good for how cheap they are. So that was that was like with my my Loki weapon system, which is my sub MOA AR. It's like sub half MOA AR, eighteen inch barrel. The owner, uh, his name was Eric, and he, I talked to him about it when he made the trigger system for me. And he's like, "What do you want?" I'm like, "I want this to be a target rifle." He's like, "Okay, so you want it as light as possible?" Yes. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he's like, just be careful because this will bump fire. I didn't, this was like before bump stocks even came out. And I was like, I don't even know what a bump fire is. And then I finally get it to the range and I have it on bags and I'm actually keeping as little contact with my shoulder on the rifle as possible. There's some contact, but it's very soft because I just wanted, I didn't want any sort of inflection because I'm trying to get as tight of groups yeah. as possible. And sure enough, when I go to pull that trigger back, the bolt, pushes the rifle back into my shoulder enough that it resets the trigger. And all of a sudden it's, yep. pop, 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 you know, <laughs> and yeah. like, yeah, I mean, that's what, the, yeah. 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 It, it's like half of it is the reset. If you got a long reset, you don't need to worry, but you know, you got all that take up and everything coming back. Right. But if you got an extra short reset, an extra light trigger, right. that's when you start getting into you know, where I wouldn't necessarily go as far as carrying a striker fire gun. Right. Have you seen these idiots on YouTube that their, their pistols, their carry pistols either have like full-time switches or they have the binary trigger. The binary trigger to me on a carry pistol is the stupidest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrifying. Um, but you know, like there, there's so many people out there that, that are fine with taking these risks. You know, like I, I think there was like a meme where it's like, some people are afraid to appendix carry and there's people in Chicago that are carrying full auto switches and sweatpants. <laughs> and, and like, you know, like, like they're, they're definitely braver or stupider right. uh, than yeah. most of us, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. It's like how I get concerned about light triggers. Hey, they got no holster and a, a switch on there or something like that. Right. That's terrifying Yeah, like, from a responsible gun owner. That's terrifying to me. They're running the risk of committing a plexico burst on themselves. Very, very. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, man. All right. So we've been going for two hours now. Let's go ahead and let's wrap up the live portion and just go to the recorded portion. For all the viewers that are watching, we will be posting this to the All Are Welcome podcast channel probably tomorrow. And you'll be able to see all the fun toys that Randy is about to bust out. So, um, Randy, do you want to say anything to the live viewers before we, we end the live stream? You know, don't believe everything you hear on the internet. Uh, test things for yourself. Uh, be reasonable. Be rational. Be safe. You know? Love it, man. Love it. And to my viewers, thank you guys for stopping by. It's been a pretty responsive live stream. So just thank you, everybody. And you guys have a good night. Oregon Predator, Ninja and Flannel, help me, all you guys, uh, Black Rifle Medic. So, all right.
If you're not subscribed to Randy Reviews It, go give him a good subscribe because he puts out some really good content and he's not afraid to tell it how it is. So we're going to go ahead and end the stream right now. Talk to you guys later. All right, let's end. All right, cool. Uh, all right, so the live stream is done. Uh, do you need a break to go use the restroom or go grab oh, some? I'm good. Okay, do you have your show and tell stuff that you're yeah, ready to do? I got a do? few things, yeah. Right, because cool, now that we're on the Riverside only, I can actually... What I'll do is I'm actually going to edit the, the 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 podcast that gets posted up. So I cut out like a lot of pauses or, you know, f stupid stuff that we don't need to have posted like in a podcast. Yeah. So it stays relevant. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. What do you got for What do you got? Uh, so we have the new Zev aluminum frame. Is that the shadow systems? Yeah. So I bought the shadow systems Gen 3 slide. To go on the Zev frame, wow. and it's got a DPM recoil system in it. Mm. And so, I bought this frame just because, like, a lot of people have been getting into those Icaruses and everything like that. And uh, one, I figured a lot of people would want to see it on the channel. I've yet to make a video on it, and maybe I'm getting delayed on it. Mm -hmm. But I originally wanted to measure the recoil, like, does getting the aluminum frame. And all the weight, because this has tungsten rods in the bottom. Oh, wow. To make it weigh pretty heavy. Um, the Zev has a pretty good grip. I don't think I'd ever buy the full Zev guns, just okay. with how much they they run. But like the MBK kit, if you already have some Gen 3 19s laying around, that grip frame is pretty solid. This, um, the frame, just the metal slip-on part was 550 for this. Wow. So you like all together, I don't even want to think about how much this technically cost. Right. And what was funny is I took my girlfriend to the range to try out everything to see what she liked. And this is what she picked. Um, so I was like, uh, I wish you would have picked, you know, like the Hellcat Pro or something right. like that. Yeah. But like, this is what she really, really liked. I think that they do a good enough job though on the plastic frame that this isn't necessarily necessary. Okay. That makes sense. You mentioned Icarus. I actually reached out to Icarus because I wanted to get one of their aluminum frames for my TAC yeah. Ops. Um, and when I called them, I, I was calling as a consumer, right? And I was like, hey, I just want to buy one of these, you know, and I'll probably end up putting it on my YouTube channel to do a review. And the woman's like, oh, well, we're out of the black frame, but we have the gold and the titanium nitride. And I was like, no, this is for my carry pistol. This isn't for a review. And she's like, well, we don't have the black one in. It might not be in for six to eight months, yada, yada, yeah. yada. And I was, like, out. I was like, okay. She goes, but I think this would look better on your channel. I was like, well, are you guys going to like give it to me then to re do a review? On? She's like, no. no, well, you still have to pay yeah. for it. And I was like, you don't understand what I'm saying, lady. And we got into like an argument because <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to pay $500 or whatever it was for a... So Gold, yeah. you know, for a handle to go on my carry pistol. To be like a better loop drop. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's yeah. like, hey, get the guy with the gold one. <laughs> yeah, the gold gun, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. She she couldn't understand why I didn't want to buy a gold grip for my personal carry pistol. And she's like, it's going to look better in your YouTube review. I was like, I'll do one YouTube review with this and then not want to carry it. And then I've wasted $500. And, and there's a lot of companies that are doing those frames for those p365 like sharps brothers is doing one that looks really like gentlemen you know they yeah. got wood side panels and everything like that yeah. but so like there's a lot of companies how does that how does that shadow systems or run then for you with that zeb grip do you like it oh it it's it's really really soft shooting um it's really well balanced like shadow systems i think for their slide stuff does some of the best just because the the optics mounting like their screws are like like an inch long like really? they're deep yeah they they change the internals of the glock like some of the stuff so that the screws can go wild and then like mm. they got like such a nice universal kit for them or just like really cheap like uh plates to fit your optic like dead on so i'm a big fan of this i shoot this a decent amount the zev trigger is pretty good it's like three and a half okay um, and it's pretty light breaking, but this is like, 
one of the most Gucci Glocks that I've seen. Right. I mean, there's obviously like the agency and stuff like that, but I bought this. I was like, let's see what if I really just dump money into a Glock, how good can I make it? Would you thing. trust that build for a conceal and carry? Yes. Okay. Go I ahead. had uh I think I've got like eleven hundred through this now. Wow. So yeah, it's it's been running. Originally, I was like nervous about like the DPM spring because you can feel when you rack it, like the difference in how the spring feels. So I was like, oh, is this going to have issues going into battery? Because the Zevs just in general do have a little bit of the break in. Like I could barely get the slide on there. The machining tolerances between Shadow and Zev, like they're tight tolerances. So once you get enough rounds through it, I haven't had any failures, but I've had. I guess like two where I just had to tap it in a battery and like the first 50 rounds after that, it was fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, shadow systems does come with the, like they tell you, like there's a break in period. Like what is it? Yeah. Like 250 or 500 rounds. I forget what it is. But yeah. It's somewhere. It, it's like 200 or 250. Yeah. I think that's what it is. I think that's what it is. But so. like I had shadows that have like five K plus through them and okay. that trigger gets a lot smoother. That's what, where they have issues right off the bat is their trigger doesn't feel that great when okay. you first get them. Okay. But like after a few thousand, that thing smooths out just like a Glock trigger does. Yeah. And it gets pretty nice. Yeah. That's the one thing I will say that's inconsistent about Glocks is their triggers. Like my buddy, yeah. my buddy bought a Glock 43 X and the trigger that came with that thing. Like I was at the store with him when he bought it and they had a display Glock and we picked it up and I was like, Ooh, the trigger on this is Gucci. Yep. And this is this is nice. And so the guy's like, all right, you want the Glock 43X? He's like, yeah, but I want one from the back. I don't want one that people have handled. He was one of those guys, right? Yeah. And I was like, I oh. want the one that people have handled. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I want the one yeah. that I've handled and I know what it feels yeah. like, right? Yeah. So then the guy's like, sure. So he brings out the box and I'm sitting there going like, don't you even want to try it? And he's like, no, it's fine. And then does the paperwork, gets it. And I was like, we're sitting in like the truck afterwards i was like can i feel it the one of the worst triggers i've ever felt oh yeah and it was so bad and then when i bought a clock 43x um it wasn't nearly as bad as his but i was like eh, it's not great and i ended up throwing an apex trigger in it and i ended up falling in love with it then i bought a clock 43x mos and the trigger on that thing is by far one of the best factory triggers i've ever felt in my oh life. yeah and so it's just crazy because I've handled three 43 X's and all three came with like completely different triggers, like different feels altogether. I don't know. Yeah. You I've had different consistency with Glocks. The one trigger that I absolutely despise factory is like the CZ double action. Okay. Yeah. Like, like you can feel it stack. So like, I see why everyone gets like a Cajun mm. right off the bat or else if you get a shadow, and you're shooting it, you know, like mostly single action. It's okay. not as bad. But that double action on those CZs is pretty rough. Okay. Interesting. All right. Well, this is my Alchemy Custom uh, Prime Elite. So this I have just over 3,000 rounds through it. Wow. Um, I w That's 45, so like, right? Or 10? Yeah, it's 45. Okay. But, um,. Like, it's got the figured walnut grips. Yeah, that's gorgeous, man. And then it's got actual gold bead, let's see, gold yeah. bead front sight, Ooh. where it's like 14 carat, I think. And that gold bead front sight in sunlight is amazing. Like, it looks, like, I was like, it's not going to be that great. I bought this as kind of like an heirloom piece to hand down to the kiddo uh, when he gets older. But I got, like, they do, like, a traditional bluing, and it wears in really, really nice. Like, you can oh, wow. see, like how it wears in from yeah. where my hand was sitting against it and things like that. But these are bushing guns. But if you follow Sage Dynamics or any of these people, I when I ordered this, they didn't make a high uh, double stack yet. Okay. But if I could do it all over again, I'd probably get a double stack 9mm high cap from them. But I think Alchemy probably makes what you get for what you pay one of the better... 1911 slash 2011s, hands down. Because I've shot Nighthawks that have felt amazing. I've shot Wilsons that I've had terrible time with. Right. I've shot Staccatos that have usually been good. Like this, you know, has like an inch and a half guarantee without the Les Bear break-in period. Really? You know? Wow. 
And I take this to the range, and you have to try to miss with this. Like That's it's awesome. wild. It's wild. Well, I you uh, know it's funny because like I haven't shot an actual 1911 in a hot minute. Like it's been a yeah. hot country minute since I've shot a 1911. But I just purchased like several weeks ago a grip improver for the Glock 43x48 made by Rapid Engineering. And it's, it's it increases your length of pull, so it increases the back strap yep. portion. But it it's, gives you a better angle. It takes it from the Glock twenty two to an eighteen, like a a um, yeah. nineteen eleven. And man, the pointability now with my Glock is so much better. Like it blew me away. And it was only a twenty five dollar you know piece of plastic that three yeah. D prints. But I have bigger hands. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm like I'm I'm a I'm a 242 pound guy. I'm a bigger guy. And so when I grab onto that Glock 43X, my finger's going way past the trigger guard. And so once I got that extension, the, the large uh, back strap on there, man, that really helped with that length of pull, but that just improvement on the, the grip angle, I couldn't believe how good that was. I mean, it was yeah, that's fantastic. What, I mean, essentially like the Zev, Mm -hmm. like they may that's what like one of the big selling points is just basically like a 1911 grip angle i love that on that and uh that makes such a big difference to me i mean like a dream pistol for me is like a cabot rebellion Mm. that's either like a double stack or not but the the cabot rebellion they have some technology that takes it from a 1911 better like it's got an internal extractor it's got um a lugless design like there's some real technology gains wow. with that, but you're looking at Cabot prices, you know? Right. Um, unfortunately. Uh, and then I, I guess the last handgun for show and tell, I posted this on Reddit and got flamed, but this works so well is PX4. Yeah. Which uh, I'm going to send a Langdon and I'm actually uh, hopefully getting a PX4 GSD, the new one. Okay. To test. Uh, but the PX4 for me, everyone knocks it because of how it looks, but it's like the softest shooting, like one of the best, most comfortable guns, hands right. down. And like, I think that I, I actually took this to the range this last weekend, shot it neck and neck with a Beretta 92 and everything else. This shoots softer to me than like oh, hey. guns, exponentially bigger, heavier, all that stuff. This rotating barrel is like wild with what it does yeah i mean it's kind of like the technology that they put into a chris vector chris vectors look yeah. stupid but i uh, had one yeah you, you had a vector yeah but man yeah it's, i had a i had a 9mm gun. vector yeah. yeah and uh after going to iv 88 88 the vector i still think an mp5 shoots softer than a vector but that mean arms uh bearing delay upper is amazingly soft shooting because it's in you know like an ar platform too and then that cmmg descent that 9mm it's got a radial delay in there oh wow i would never buy a 9mm blowback gun but like anything with a delay makes a big difference with like a roller but yeah, yeah. A roller delay radial delay bearing delay any of those things are like to me that's what you want to go for mm. but like this px4 it's got terrible grip texture, like okay. you know, like all the Langdon ones. So I just put some hockey tape on there. It's got a really, really slick coating on it, too. Uh, put some tape there. And everyone on Reddit was like, that tape's going to fall off when it gets hot. And I mag dump five mags through this, <laughs> um, like, like lightning with this. And they're still holding up. But, like, this gun shoots so great. And I would say there's two guns that do 40 Smith & Wesson right. The Beretta PX4 and 40 is really, really good. And then the HK, they do a 40 Smith & Wesson better than most. Yeah. Um, Like, I got a VP40, and that thing shoots softer than my Walther PPQM1. Wow. Like, hands down. I take people to the range all the time. I go, which one shot, like, which one recoil more? Right. They always go the Walther. How much longer do you think it's going to be that, you know, because we, we were old enough, we got to live through the transition where – you know, there was still an argument of 45 ACP is better, 40 is better, 9 millimeters better. And then now they're like, oh, you know, ballistic testing say 9 millimeters the best. So everybody's kind of been funneled into the 9 millimeter train, 
you know how long do you think it'll be before there's another cartridge out there that kind of breaks people out from the nine millimeter trend? oh there's way too many people right now that are pushing the the 10 millimeter and 5.7 agenda yeah on things yeah like you know like why would Smith and Wesson make an M and P in five seven unless they knew they were going to sell them? And it's the same with you see all these companies making ten mm. Sig's got the X ten now, P three twenty X ten. Right. All these people are moving into these calibers. They're either going for velocity or like magnum, and they're like, well, I got to get this just in case bears. How many bears are around? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like it, 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 it's not. Yeah, I, I still think forty Smith and Wesson from a ballistic standpoint is better. It's just how well can you shoot it right. is where the argument gets lost. And that's where something like a Beretta PX4 or an HK or something like that that was built around 40 and it shoots it well, it might make the deciding factor. But if you're picking up, like, I mean, Glocks had a track record of they were splitting around some of that hot 40. Uh, and they're not fun to fire in 40. Neither are, like, the Springfields or anything like that. So I get it. But, I mean, there's still people shooting competition, and there's a reason there's a major power factor category because it makes a difference. You know? Absolutely. That's a good point. That's a, that's a really good point. I, I still love my P30. It's, it's one of my bed stand guns. So. And then last thing here, so this is the fresh built, my first build. Uh, that's and a Hawksworks suppressor, isn't it? Build. Yeah, so this is the 762 <laughs> titanium I have on this one. So I keep the Helix 5.56 on my home defense gun. But I just built this. And that's one thing I would recommend to people, like on any, like BCM furniture. Like I love that angled vert that they do. And this is their hand stop, which is pretty good. I love the irregular defense furniture as well. Like it, if I'm going to put stuff on a gun, like that's up there. But one of the things I, I want to talk about just a little bit with this is, so I botched my first build. I botched this. Um, the handguard I ordered from Brunel's and it didn't come with an instruction manual or the tool I needed. Oh no. And I just kind of bubbled it together the first time. I was like, well, a handguard's got to do this. And there's these set screws and blah, blah, blah. So it's a wedge lock and I put it on, twisted the wedge lock and the handguard pushed away from the receiver. And I was like, uh oh, it's uh -oh. not supposed to do that. And apparently you're supposed to put in the set screws first and oh. then do the wedge lock. So that it can't twist away from the receiver and you tighten it down. So I hit up Sons of Liberty and I was like, look, I botched this. Uh, I actually uh, stripped one of the set screws, putting it in. And I don't know how well I did on this. Like, here's some pictures. And they go, send it to us. So for free, I sent them my upper that I botched personally. They turned it around in like two and a half weeks, maybe. Wow. They installed it, they put the set screws on, and they sent it back. And the only thing of Sons of Liberty on here is the handguard. So they're working on, like, this is an arrow barrel, and then the bolt carrier group. And the only thing I had was a Sons of Liberty handguard, and they did it up. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sons of Liberty is the company that if you buy one of their fully built ARs and you have to use it in a self-defense situation, it gets confiscated, they'll replace it for you for free? Is that the company? I don't know if they do that. I know Shadow Systems does it on their pistols. Okay. Well, yeah, I've heard of Shadow Systems. I know there's an AR manufacturer. I'll have to look it up. Um, but I know, I think it's Sons of Liberty, but there's a company out there. And their rifles are like $1,500. They shoot probably more around like a $1,000 rifle. But I've seen some r really good stuff from them. And like that whole customer service thing, I've seen the dude's phone number posted on discords like wow. give him a call he'll hop on a call and walk through things just like you probably know with blackout defense and tom in the back he's hopping on calls like these companies now sons of liberty is doing some wild things uh especially i'm interested in that 6mm max that's coming out down the road because that's one of the goals this year is to get into reloading that's awesome so you yeah. should check out my buddy uh, Austin. He's he he does the reloading Weatherby page. Now, granted, most of it's geared towards, well, ninety nine percent of it's geared like towards hunting and match, hunting yeah. and hunting and match. And it's essentially he he likes to you know hand load everything to see what he can squeeze out of a rifle, right, and yeah. to get it shooting. But he also likes to do kind of what my Arkansas ballistics buddy does, where he likes to expose 
um, companies that try to sell, you know, ammunition saying, oh, it does this, but not even just that, but also expose rifle cartridges that people are being sold like a bag of goods. Like, for example, one of the latest things is um, 7 mm PRC, so 7 millimeter oh, PRC. Oh, yeah. And, I've been seeing that show up at like the ranges and stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. And they claim it's like a 3000 plus FPS round. And he went out and bought a whole bunch of factory ammo with different lots and stuff like that. Uh, and it was shooting around 2,800 feet per second. Like, and he compared it to a seven millimeter Remington Magnum. Right. And people yeah. in, in the comment section are like, Oh yeah, seven PRC will smoke the pants off a seven rim Magnum. And so he does what he call, calls his like drag races where yeah. he, he shoots both guns side by side. And then whoever comes out and that seven rim mag took that damn seven PRC to Gapplebee's, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, that's what. Uh, yeah, this year I, I want to get into reloading and uh, I need one of those Garmin's for like right. velocity measurement or something like that. But I want to just get into like I'm a big fan of the short barrel. So that six mm max does like real work out of 10 fives and things like that, or even 11 fives. And you can get like 55 to like 110 grain. And it, it just uses a 350 legend mag. So it's not like this wild Grendel mag that's like bent around and all that stuff. Well, dude, I appreciate you coming on. We've been going almost for two and a half hours. Yeah. You've been an awesome guest. Do you do a lot of podcasts? No, nah, no. Nah. I, I went on one of Yankee Marshall's podcast once to God. criticize him Yeah, to criticize him because of how he conducted himself at shot show. Like he's just going up to booths and he's like, what kind of a idiot would make this piece of trash? And right. I was like, look, it's just some marketing person there. Like, they, know. They, you know, like they're just doing their job and you're like ragging on them. I went on his, that was about it. But, uh, what is it? Johnny B and Jared and those guys are like, you should do some podcasts and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, like this is definitely like my hobby that's turned into somewhat of a side business, mm -hmm. but my main job is always going to be my main job. I think. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. No, it's funny. You brought up Yankee Marshall, dude. I normally don't get pissed off at comments unless it's geared towards like my family. Right. Yeah. You know, or if I have a guest on and somebody says something, I'll, I'll block you. But somebody made a comment that I was Yankee Marshall's long lost son. And I was like, <laughs> oh, come on. That's that's level. That one well, made me a little upset. You shower, so you can't be related. <laughs> you know, like, or, uh, you know, and, and it's like, how many revolvers do you own? Probably not that many. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. He has, God, he has so much. Yeah. I'm kind of a collector. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, I, I, it's, there's certain people in the industry and, you know, I went through IV 88, 88 and I've met some people and I've, I've seen some things that I'm not a fan of, but also some things that I'm actually more of a fan of. Like one of the things, like just being a viewer, I used to think that like Such, I was like, man, he always says his guns are good. And then I met him and he's just genuinely the nicest human on earth. Yeah. And and like, he's always, right. he, he, he seemed like he was always looking at the good. Like he was one of the kindest people I think I've ever met. That's and awesome. so like, I get why his reviews have that like like this is a good thing you know yeah, it's his personality reflected in his videos yeah absolutely you know and, and that's one of the things like uh bullets for bucks I, I did he came on my podcast and it's funny because we actually kind of met each other his channel only had about like sixty thousand subs when i commented and mine had like a thousand but we both bought some weatherby rifles the the mark five backcountry 2.0s and he got like the carbon mark and i got the titanium and we were both having issues with ours he couldn't get like a bullet to yeah. extract i couldn't get mine to um i i was getting light primer strikes right and so we okay. kind of we connected on that like years ago and then once he came on my channel we started talking and i was like i know where i remember you from you had the problem with the weather bee and he's like oh yeah, yeah. And i was like i commented because i was having the problem with the weather bee. he's like oh yeah we talked about that so it is kind of a cool community most of the people that i've actually interacted with so far to get on the podcast because the podcast portion for me is a hobby i like to yeah. get to know people get people exposure get my viewers to be able to see new content creators. Cause I'm not jealous. I don't want to hold people just to my channel. I want people to be out yeah. and actually getting a good education, good entertainment, 
from as many people as possible. Um, and, and I would say 90% of the people that I've interacted so far with have been fantastic. There's been some that have kind of been, I've straight up had somebody tell me your channel's too small. I won't, I won't come on that. And the funny wow. thing is they had less subscribers than like some other people that I've had on, you know, and, and those people are like, yeah, man, anytime you want to do a podcast, just let me know if I got time, I'll jump on there with you, you know? So most of the people yeah. are cool. Uh, there's just been some that have been eh, like, you're cool. I get wild in the comments sometimes when people are like, I don't know if you know who Beretta 9mm USA is. No. Well, there was a drama a while back where they got a big discount from Alchemy and like it was like, hey, review our guns. So then they started trying to like take advantage of Alchemy where they're like, we want a ported bull one. And they're like, we don't do that. And they go, so you're not a custom shop. Well, they had these really glowing reviews out on YouTube and they went back and changed the titles of them mm. and then made some videos that these guns are trash. They're not full custom and all this stuff after they were like, this is how a custom gun should be. So I get wild in the comments yeah. when it's like you didn't get your discount and now you're upset or right. you, you didn't actually use the gun and you're giving it this glowing review or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so. that's that's kind of the funny thing is a lot of the bigger YouTubers, we're not talking like the top tier, you know, not like the S class people, which would be like Garand Thumb and and Iraq Veteran eighty eight and you know, people that in Hickok and stuff like that that have kind of like their own they're they're above the proverbial proverbial glass ceiling that a lot of us gun tubers are stuck below. Uh but yeah. we're talking about the people that are pressed up right against that glass ceiling that have, you know, maybe a million subscribers or something like that. Uh, a lot of those people get demonetized from YouTube and they say it's like one of the best things that happens to them because then they're no longer confined by like the handcuffs is I feel like a lot of us, when we first get monetized, you know, we start getting channel or we, we spend like a week making a video editing it and then we upload it and YouTube's like, here's the yellow dollar sign. And you're like request review. And they're like confirmed yeah. by review. We get upset, right? But once once you get to like a certain level, people no longer care because their monetization from advertisement is less than what they get paid to actually make a video. Yeah, you know, by a I don't really care uh, to be honest. Right. Like, I'll have some that I have a bunch that are you know like limited monetization or whatever. Yeah, and you know I'm just like it happens. Like if it draws in people to watch the next video that might get monetized, okay. But I would rather put out stuff that helps people. Because I'm not I'm not struggling on cash. I I do pretty well. Nice. And and it's like I would rather have be able to face them because I go to events and stuff. I would rather be able to face them and just be honest. And my whole opinion was honest and look myself in the mirror every morning and be okay with it. You nice. Know? What exactly? I, I what exactly is your day job? If you don't mind me asking. So I'm a software consultant. Uh, I implement software. Okay. Uh, basically, like uh, like HR software. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's that's a cool thing. So it pays. So well. it's it's funded this YouTube this 24k last year that I I I'm trying to mitigate. I got a few things that are going to mitigate that I think this year. Okay. Like one of the things, uh, big shout out. I I don't have my affiliate link yet, but uh, I've bought like 14,000 rounds from Callaway Ballistics this year. Mm. And it's mostly been reman because I've been trying to do things on the cheap. Right. And I haven't had any issues. Right. Which, you know, way back in the day before I had YouTube, I bought like Freedom Munitions reman, and I had a rough time with that right. stuff. Yeah. So Callaway Ballistics has been awesome. And uh, like, are they going to sponsor you? Uh, I don't know if they'll sponsor. I might have a code. Okay. You know, gotcha. like I'm working on getting a code, just one personal use, <laughs> you yeah. know, like I got to buy another, you know, 3000 for testing in the next two months or something like right. that. So right. what's something, let's say, cause I know we're getting a little short on time, but let's say with the gun tube community, right. That you want to bring to YouTube that you see is lacking in the actual gun tube community. What do you think that is? I think like honest comparisons and, and that's what, so to get a little, I'm working on a site where people will be able to give their opinions and score things. And then, you know, like, let's say, you know, uh, there's a, a reviewer score 
a, a user score of something so that you can go in and you can say, well, the PX4 got a 96 out of 100. Here's why. That sort of thing. So, like, bringing all the data together because, you know, Grantham's tried all these guns. Uh, Mr. Guns and Gear has tried all these guns. But they haven't – a lot of times they're not saying, I compared the Radiant and the Sons of Liberty, and here's what was different. Right. They're, they're doing an individual video on it, and they're saying this is a good gun. But you don't know by the margin on how much it's mm-hmm. better than another one. That's an interesting thing. I mean, there's – I don't think there's an actual website that does that yet, if I'm going to be honest. There's one I know of. <laughs> yeah? And that's – yeah, that's where I get a little careful because uh, they're doing their thing, and I've seen their site. And my original idea, like being in data and some of that analysis, like there's some things that they aren't doing that I'm going to do. Okay. And it was the original idea because I think, too, uh, a lot of the, let's say the gun that Grantham gets, do you think that they don't inspect that before they send it to Grantham? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. So it's, for me, it's actual buyer data that I'm the most interested in. Mm-hmm. Like... You know, uh, what was it? The flannel, uh, your guy in the chat. Yeah, Ninja and Flannel. Yeah. Ninja and Flannel might have an arrow and he's got 10,000 rounds and no issues. Right. But there might be some gun tuber that's like, I had issues after 5,000. But if you have, you know, when you actually do a sample size of a population, right. you get a more accurate represent representation of where it actually gets, what the issue. And I think one of the other things that we don't have right now this might be giving away some of my secrets, but I'm okay with it because I'd rather see people do it, is when you walk into a gun shop, you don't know the actual value that something should be priced at. Hmm. Hmm. That's so, a, yeah. So, like, Geisley, I did, you know, my AR tier list, and Geisley I dropped because I was like, this is a $2,400 gun that's just DI. And then everyone in the comments is like, well, you got to buy it on sale, and it's only 15 And I was like, well... Wow. Okay, so if I collected data, how much would you pay for this? And then someone goes into a gun shop and they pull up my website and something's listed at 2500 and said the most we'd pay is 22 They might walk away. There's, so there's what – I'm just pitching this out there because I'm a program manager. I have a master's in business. I think what you should do is take your website and that portion, convert it into an app, right? And, oh, yeah. And have like a QR scanner or a barcode scanner. Because model there, number, all mo- that stuff, model yeah. number that that you can just plug it in or just scan the barcode for it and then have it automatically tell you. Because I know that there's a, it's like a, a hardware app where you can walk into like a Home Depot and yep. it, it'll and you scan the barcode and it'll tell you it, it goes to like a database and it'll tell you if other people are selling it for cheaper, you know, yeah. or, or what the market value is. Yeah, that that's what it's like. What's the market value on this thing? Because there's right. some local gun shops that give you amazing deals, right. and then there's some that gouge you pretty hard yeah. on things. Yeah. And and it's not just that, but like, you know, like what would you actually pay for this? Like, hey, right. wait for the sale, or that way, two manufacturers get feedback where it's like, hey, we're not having the sales we want. We find out we're about 150 marked over right. what people would pay. Let's knock that down a little bit, and we'll start selling where we want. So I want er- everyone to benefit from okay. it. Okay. So what is what is going to be as you grow your channel? Then what's going to be your target demographic then for viewers that you hope to you know accumulate as subscribers? So I think um, it's it's still going to be mainly like gear testing and comparisons, mm-hmm. but also like comparing it to the field of right. like things. One of the things that's hard too with firearms just in general is uh, human like my bio stuff is different. Our hand sizes are different. What fits us? Like, I got a scar from, like, Glock bite on my hand. Me like, too. It, it, yeah, it's biting you. But, like, the PX4 gets me no bite. You know, all the, like, so it's, like, uh, also, like, what, you know, what works for me, what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And that's where it's, like, letting people know, like, hey, you might have this issue. If you have large hands or if you have this, like, avoid this. Like, I want to save people money. Right. I want to. I, I want them to get the most value, but I also want manufacturers to go in a way where, if I suggest something, maybe they should listen. Like, hey, if you would have just done this tweak, your product would be X amount better. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that'd be awesome to get to that point. 
Now, yeah. th- with that being said, though, you know, if you're going to be a honest reviewer and whatnot, then you're never going to be that big of a champ. And I hate to say that. It's, it's oh, yeah, because, yeah. You it know, and I, and I have a mentor. I have a mentor that's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He's been doing the gun stuff for years now. And he told me, he said, reviews don't get the views. And, you know, they will get reviews when new products are coming out and whatnot. But a lot of what people are wanting to see now in the gun community is entertainment stuff. You know, where, yeah. they're, where they're, it's an entertainment, it's a massive production and whatnot. Um, and, and I think I'm kind of in the same boat as you. I don't know if I'll ever be able to say that YouTube will become my primary source of income. Um, I, I'm a defense program manager and my wife doesn't have to work. We live a traditional life and I yep. do the YouTube stuff because I just want to, I kind of like you, I want to, I want to be honest with people and, and actually put stuff out there. And I don't, you know, I do put some entertainment product or production into my channel, but I film everything with my cell phone and I edit yeah. everything with my cell phone and I upload. Now I know that if I do that, my mentors told me, he goes, your channel's never really going to take off until you actually get real camera gear. And then once you get real camera gear, it's your channel won't really take off until you get a production team. And then you will have to get people that work for you to film you. And, and there's certain styles that, you know, the big channels get that are very universal. They all kind yep. of have a very similar uh, reason why they're, they're large. It's the entertainment production value. And I got kind of an ace in the hole uh, with, with this down the road. It's going to take a little bit, but one of my friends uh, ran a drone filming business awesome. in the UK and he did commercials for like Rolls Royce, Aston Martin, worked on the Star Wars movie, like legit filming, like not just like, you know, he he had real he has real filming skills and uh, it might be a bit, but uh, he's, you know, working with me on like, hey, here's what you should get for camera. Shoot as much B-roll. Go do this. Go do that. And then, you know, maybe he pays me a few visits each year and we get to film a bunch of content like some epic openings and things like that, that people want to see. Right. And, and like, that's how it can grow too, because that's what like drew me into 1911 syndicate is you get this epic soundtrack, you get these mountains in Utah with this gorgeous gun sitting there in the sunlight. Like they have their filming down and you're right. Like to get to where it needs to be um, is also there. Like that's what you have to do to hit that next level. It's got to have that entertainment value. But I think also like the honesty, like people might go back if they're thinking about buying something. Right. I think down the road, that website that I'm looking on slash app might be like where my real stuff is. Um, Just this, you know, this idea I had, I went in and I was like, hey, you know, this doesn't exist in our community. Well, the thing that I, I like about what there. you're talking about is, is, you know, I'm, I like to drink beer. Um, it's yeah. one of the reasons why I'm a bigger guy. But there's a, a website called Beer Advocate, right? And so it has the, you know, professional beer connoisseurs that work for Beer Advocate that put their rating in on it. But nobody goes, to, like some, you, you look at that rating and it's kind of like, oh, that's cute. But what you're there to see is the actual consumer's rating of the yep. beer. And that's, that's such a more accurate rating yeah. and actually description than what the professionals are. You know, because I feel like, too, you start, you become like a professional in anything, and then you kind of lose sight of what the average Joe actually yeah. thinks about something. You know, I'm buying a $2,800 blackout defense. Like, I lose sight of what a normal person probably spends on an AR-15. Right. And also, too, I think, and there's, and then also, too, like, your target demographics, the reason why I asked that about, to you, too, is because I don't think I'm going to ever be, in my current career path as a gun tuber i'm not on path to go out there and be a kentucky ballistics or a grand thumb where it's like what can i do to break this item um you know how hard can i actually test it let me let me dump it in mud and then freeze it in a lake for the yeah. winter and then pull it out and then shoot it that's great entertainment value but it's not something that i feel like my target demographics are actually going to do with their gear. And I want to be able to relate more with my, my consumer. I don't want somebody to watch my stuff and be like, Oh, this is great entertainment, but not walk away with something educational from it. If yeah. that makes sense. And don't get yeah, me wrong. That... I love Grant Thumb. And I think he has a lot of great education, but 
how many of us are actually the average Joe going to take their rifle, open up the, you know, the chamber and then stuff mud in it and then like freeze it in a lake and then yeah. hit it with the blowtorch, you know, like why? It's- and you're right. Like some of the entertainment, there's this guy like long rifle where the, the I is a Y instead that makes, makes these videos that are so entertaining and I'm just locked in. One of the things that right now that's holding me back is I don't have enough land myself to shoot on. And I'm looking to alleviate that or change that in the next few years and being able to shoot meat targets and like see that ballistics, I think draws in people. Absolutely. And that's one thing I hope to get into right. down the road is what are these rounds doing and what are they, what are they, actually do right you know? right that's i think that's so. a great but that that too that's still educational with entertainment yeah. though with, yeah you, you get the fun maybe get some slow right. motion you know like that sort of thing right and, absolutely yeah that's, that's still educational and that is that is where i would eventually want to get to as well you know i want to be able yeah. to test out hunting rounds and build like a simulated side of an elk or a simulated side of a deer and then shoot it with like a slow mo camera and watch the explosion of guts coming out the back, but also <laughs> be able to like, dude, this is awesome entertainment value. But then at the same yeah. time, you're like, oh, this is also educational because, yeah, this bullet actually performed very well, and I would trust it if I had the shot of a lifetime on a trophy elk that I may ne- may never see again. You know? Yeah. So one of the things I think Grand Thumb's doing right now is some of it, like testing at distance. Like, yes. okay. I could shoot this thing at 20 feet, this ballistics gel, and it's going to do X, Y, Z. But what happens if I shoot it at 200 yards? Right, right. Or like, like some of the, I've seen one channel where he reloads it lighter to get the velocity of what it would be like at 200 yards. Interesting. And then he shoots it closer. And to me, like that would be kind of cool, I think, and like educational as well as like, okay, how much energy is this 556 going to carry? with this much velocity and what is it going to do when it starts getting slower? Yeah. I, uh, that's you interesting. And, and don't get me wrong. He is the guy th- that I quote when I talked about, you know, he talks about certain rifles once they lose a certain amount of velocity, especially with like a subsonic yeah. load, it's not a good battle rifle at distance. It's just not yeah. because you're then lobbing. If you have a rifle, three that's gonna, feet of drop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If you have something where after 200 yards, you're going to start getting substantial drop and you're trying to have an engagement with somebody that's at 500 yards, you're pretty much shooting a 22 at that point at 500 yards. And you're guesstimating on where the bullet's going to land, you know? So yeah, and, that and like seeing the threshold of terminal ballistics. So like an M193 might do great in the first like 150 yards, but like, where's that threshold right. of like, okay, if I put it in an 11, five though, and I shoot 170, I've lost it. You Absolutely. Know? That sort of thing. Great, great points. Great points. Yeah. Well, Randy, so, uh, thanks for yeah. coming on, dude. I really appreciate it. I, I hope we can do this again sometime. And yeah, if you ever get fun, a podcast, man. I'd like to come on it as well. You're a really good guest. You, you know, a lot of good entertainment, a lot of good education from you. Yeah. So, you know, and I wish the best to you, brother. Yeah. Good luck, man. I've been seeing you grow with those shorts. You've been getting a lot of, <laughs> a lot of traction, man. So I, well, happy that your channel's doing well. I know. So, okay. So just before I, I end the recording, uh, we could talk after I hit stop the recording, but I do want to say uh, the one thing that I've thought about doing with entertainment value, uh, cause I do the nine, four five industry, like crossbody yeah. is to actually, I, I need to look into one of those. Yeah. Right. Is to put an actual loaded Glock inside one. Right. And see, how bulletproof is a nine, four, five industries tactical fanny pack with a Glock in it, you know, because yeah. if it's oh, re- like, if you got hit, if it, you yeah. got hit, would it stop a bullet? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I kind of want to try it, but convincing my wife to let Just me don't go. wear it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Some Darwin award stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. 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 No, yeah. I'm, that could be good stuff, man. Right. Yeah. But if that, I were, if I were to do that, it would be, I would want to buy one of those, like, ballistic dummy torsos you know yep. and put it on the torso you know and then yeah i don't know yeah 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 sounds good thanks man